now, every single one of them has become obsolete because they were all proprietary. That is, somebody owned the format. All of the digital open reel tape machines, all of the digital cassette <coughs> formats, all of the digital, you know, interactive formats. Every single one of them. There were multi-part formats where, for example, you'd have a converter, and then that converter would generate a, a pseudo video signal, and that pseudo video signal would be recorded on a videotape. And then, in order to play it back, you would need to have a video recorder of that format, a video playback device of that format, which would then play it back through the the converter of that type, which would then give you playback of, of audio. All of those converters were all proprietary. They all used different data formats and different um, audio formats, and every single one of them was incompatible with the other. There were a bunch of, now at, this is all going back to sort of the dawn of the digital era when people were trying to integrate digital recording into studios that were built around tape machines. So there were many, many, many formats of digital recorders. None of them exist anymore. None of those support formats are supported. All of that, all of those formats are, are orphans now. Whereas all of the digital, all of the analog recordings going back into the 1930s and the Fuhrer and everything, all, all of that is still perfectly playable. You could bring me a tape from any era of history and within a, a, a short period I could rig up a way to play it for you and, to, and you could hear what was on it. That's not true of any of the digital formats up until today. Now there's, a, there's something of a standardization in, where people are principally using Pro Tools as a, as a standard, um, except for the people that use Nuendo or, or uh, the people that use, uh, what's the thing that you get free with it? Uh, Macintosh? Okay. Garage yeah. Band? Yeah. Uh, or the, the people that, or the people that use Reaper, or the, you know, apart from all the people that don't use Pro Tools, Pro Tools is kind of a standard. The problem with that is that Pro Tools is also beholden to its parent company, Avid, who nearly went out of business a few years ago. I don't know if you guys knew about that, but Avid was on the precipice of going out of business and essentially making Pro Tools obsolete as well, which would have scuttled uh, another 20 years worth of recording. And I don't know if any of you have had to mount an archaic Pro Tools session on a contemporary Pro Tools uh, system, but not a lot of things are compatible, are backwards compatible, or beyond a few generations. So, uh, apart from this, the, the fragility of the storage medium, which is a big advantage for analog recording, but the fact that the analog systems are, are long-term constants, that is, they behave the same way now that they did 50 years ago. They have the same formats that they did 50 years ago. The machines behave the same way. They, uh, and the fact that there's nothing either legal or practical preventing somebody from making another tape machine if they want wanted to. The I have a lot more confidence in masters that have that were recorded in analog domain than in the digital domain. That does mean that I'm giving up on a lot of the fancy things that you can do with digital recording. Like the the facilities of digital recording are extremely powerful, and I understand how seductive they are. Um, I have developed analog methods to get around <coughs> almost everything that would otherwise have been done digitally. And most of the things that are done in the digital domain were originally done in the analog domain. They're sort of the descendants of techniques and things that were invented or, or practic made practical in the analog domain. And so you can still do them in an analog session. For example, editing from one tape to another. Trivially easy in the analog domain even easier than that in the digital domain, but it's still trivially easy to do in the analog domain, and I edit multi-track masters on essentially every record that I work on. Like it's rare for me to get through um, doing a record where I don't have to do some editing of the multi-track master. So um, that that shouldn't be, that's not an argument for not using analog methods. Like the, the, the ease of manipulation of the sound in the digital domain uh, is very powerful, and you do um, you do limit yourself slightly by working in the analog domain. But in it, my exposure to digital recording as an, a studio owner, I own a studio in Chicago where we have two studios, and most of the other sessions that are done in those studios are digital sessions, and so I see digital sessions underway all the time. My experience 
but as an observer in those sessions have been that um, there is much more editing done to recordings than is absolutely necessary. And the ease of the editing technique means that they are done more often because it's easy to do, it gets done more often. And um, I would argue that a lot of that stuff is kind of pro forma and from operating from a defensive posture and not necessarily done in service of the, of the recording, but that's me speaking from a slightly like chauvinistic perspective with respect to the analog method. So, um, I've been talking for a while and I've said a whole lot of things. Does anybody have any questions about the bullshit that I've said so far? <laughs> <laughs> like, does anybody, is it, is anything that I said to anybody sound like it's not true? <laughs> <laughs> no. I've got a quick question. Go. Um, you said that you went uh, connected to tape for romantic reasons yes. or nostalgia or the sound. Yes. Is there a sound? Would you, would there you is definitely a yeah. difference between an analog system. Uh, one of the things about analog systems that I think is, uh, which, which I think is, is part of the responsibility of the engineer, is to understand the way that the analog systems are nonlinear. Um, digital systems, when pro properly in implemented, can be extremely linear. That is, like, I have been, this wasn't true until fairly recently, I'd say the last, last five, six years. Uh, a high resolution digital format, like 24 bits with reasonable sample frequency. Um, I find it difficult to distinguish between the analog master and a, a high resolution 24 bit capture of the analog master. So like when I'm in a mastering studio, and we're playing the tape back and I'm playing back a 24 bit capture, for example. I find it difficult to distinguish between the two. And I feel like sometimes I can hear a slight difference and sometimes I can't. And so I'm, perfectly happy with that. I'm perfectly happy to say that the sound of digital systems is satisfactory. I don't think there's any, I don't have any reservation about the sound of digital systems. There are things about analog systems that we need to accommodate or that we need to be aware of. Um, there are, for multi-track recording in professional setting, there are basically two standard tape speeds, 15 inches a second and 30 inches a second. Um, at 30 inches a second, there is a, owing to the, the physics of manufacturing, of construction tape heads, the, that is the head core that is playing back off the tape, there's a limitation in the low frequency response when the tape is running at high speed. So <coughs> if you plot the frequency response, when you get down to below about 80 or 100 hertz, you start to get a gradual roll off in the low frequencies. And then when you get down to about 50, 40 hertz, you're losing several dB of signal integrity at very low frequencies. And down at the bottom end, of, you know, the bottom octave or so of the, of the audio range in the 30, 20 hertz region, at 30 IPS tape machines basically don't reproduce very much at all. There's a, a, a little bit of bias noise and a little bit of the uh, harmonics of the, of the signal, but that sub-basement low frequency stuff is, is essentially not there uh, on thir at 30 inches a second. <coughs> for that reason, most of the sessions that I do for rock bands or bands where there's significant bass energy, um, I, end up, I do those sessions at 15 inches a second. 15 inches a second, you get that bottom octave much better represented. You're reasonably flat down to about 40 hertz, and then you get very gradual roll off, and you still have significant usable audio down into the, in the 20, 30 hertz region. So, um, bearing in mind a couple of facts, like the low E on a bass guitar, for example, is 42 hertz. So if you're recording a conventional rock band, there's enough information down in that bottom octave that by running the tape at 30 inches a second, you're losing a significant amount of it. Um, <coughs> now, if you're doing, a, say, an acoustic session where it's banjo and fiddle and dulcimer and things of that nature, or, you know, harp and singing and that, where there's not a lot of low frequency energy, where there's not a lot of power in the, in the bass frequencies, then running the session at 30 inches a second, you get a, a couple of other subtle advantages at the very high end of the spectrum. You get a little bit more high frequency clarity, a little bit less perceived noise. <coughs> I should point out that the, that the noise spectrum of the tape is essentially flat. But when you increase the tape speed, you move 
the spectrum up. So if you double the take speed, you move the spectrum of the noise up an octave. So the take noise is perceived less. You have less perceived noise. But if you measured it in a full spectrum, you would get approximately the same amount of noise. But it, the perceived noise level is lower. Um, you get slightly less take saturation, meaning you get slightly sharper transients, slightly less of the limiting or, or saturation effects of um, what's called self erasure or over bias, where spiky high frequency signals tend to overdrive the tape and cause a slight amount of self erasure. So things like cymbals and snare drum and banjo and acoustic guitar and trumpet, where the spiky high frequency energy is a significant amount of the signal on tape, um, it's possible for that high frequency energy to cause some self erasure and lose some intensity. And that happens less at 30 inches a second because there's, there's more oxide material going by the head per second that you lose less. Yep. So there are some slight and subtle advantages to working in either take speed, right? Um, so as an engineer, it's your part of my job to know what kind of music I'm working on and know what the requirements of that music are, whether it needs to be whether I need to pay more attention to the low frequency power and, and integrity or the high frequency clarity and noise spectrum, that sort of thing. So the, um, the effect of the limitations of the tape is that it allows you to tune the parameters of the session to accommodate the style of music that you're recording. Right. Um, a, a, another couple of quick examples. like the. Um, the recording level that you use on tape has a couple of effects. If you're recording at, at a level where you are using essentially the full headroom of the tape, um, then at the very top end of that, you're occasionally going to overshoot what would be the linear region of the tape, and you're going to start causing some of those saturation or self erasure effects. Right? If you are working on music that's exceedingly demanding in its dynamic range, then you shouldn't be recording that hot, because then you will be running into those saturation effects more frequently. So you should adjust the recording, the standard of your recording, so that you're recording at a lower level on the tape, so that you have more headroom. The compromise there is that you have a little bit more perceived noise in the background, because the background noise is static, and you're lowering the audio relative to the background noise. For most music that is, say, a full band, a full complement of instruments, playing most of the time where there's no big gaps and silences, that sort of thing is not a problem. Um, but if you were working on music that is that goes from very quiet, very pianissimo, is that the right yeah. Italian? Yeah. Uh, to triple S, is that the big one? Yeah. So uh, the super loud, if you have a, a session that does that a lot, uh, then you have to be conscious of, the, of the, the limitation that you're creating for yourself. Either you're creating a limitation at the lower end by raising the noise floor, or you're creating a limitation at the upper end by causing some potential for saturation or something. I'm going to take this hat off even though my hair is absurd. <laughs> I could feel the hat creeping up and it was really <laughs> nice. um, I apologize for my hair. I, uh, my <laughs> preferred haircut for many years was a, a very short flat top. But um, it was recently appropriated by the Nazis, and so I, 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 I just refused to have a fast hair. Um, Good for you. Haven't figured anything. Haven't figured out what to do otherwise, though. So uh, it, I'm just I'm just letting go, and it's just been a, a fucking disaster. <laughs> and the the ski cap solution it worked fine outdoors, and it, but I, the top of my head was sweating. So um, so. There are limitations to analog uh, systems, but all of the boundaries are very soft, and they're all within the control of the engineer. Like you can adjust the session so that you're operating within the linear region of the tape for the important part of the music. You can adjust the, the standard of the tape machine so that um, you, you don't run out of headroom, except in those brief moments where it doesn't matter, like the very loudest bit at the end of the song when the guy hits the cymbal extra hard. There's a brief moment of saturation, which doesn't affect the sound quality or perceived volume or anything. So that sort of thing, all of that's within the control of the engineer. And so it's, uh, there are limitations on it. It's not a perfectly linear system. But the limitations can all be adapted to the session so that you're using the 
the linear part of the range of the tape for the part of the session that matters the most. And there are also there are other little gimmicky things that you can do. Like for example, on this session, the first eight or nine, the first nine tracks of the tape are the drum kit, right? The drum kit is all transient information, um, and so I want to have as much header in there as possible. If I wanted to be a real dick about it, I could align those tracks on this session to have maximum headroom and not concern myself so much about the tape noise on those tracks. Then the middle eight tracks, for example, are going to be things like bass guitar, electric guitar, um, organ, things of that nature, where the sort of steady state sounds, where the, the dynamic range is much more limited. You know, you don't have any big transients, you don't have any, you know, real gaps and silences. The background noise inherent in the amplifiers and stuff, so the noise floor doesn't really matter, but I don't need to accommodate a whole lot of headroom. I could align those tracks to a different standard so that those tracks were then operating in a, a more saturated region, for example, where I didn't have to accommodate so much headroom. Then the, the last few tracks are going to be the vocals and overdubs and such. So for those, I'd want to have the noise at an absolute minimum. And again, they're not going to have very sharp transients. And so I could have those recorded, I could record those tracks at an even more elevated level. I can use a different bias point because I know the high frequency content is, isn't going to be as high. Those kind of stunt alignments are rarely used, uh, but you, it's perfectly possible to do that. And if you had a very demanding session where you're going to be working on that same material for an extended period, it's not out of the question to do that, and I know some engineers that did do that. And uh, the last generation of tape machines, like the Computer 820 and the 827, for example, could store multiple alignments within the machine so that, you know, okay, well, I'm working on this album, and I know that that album had this gimmick alignment. I can recall that alignment by pressing a button on the machine, that sort of thing. That, this machine doesn't have that capability, but y if I was going to be working on this record for this week, and nothing else, then I could certainly align the machine that way and, and take, a, take an advantage of those characteristics. Even within one reel of tape, you could have all of these different characteristics accommodated. So, um, one last thing. Uh, um, running the tape at 15 inches a second, you have two other options, two other choices. You, you can, there are two different equalization curves that were standardized. At the beginning of the recording era, in North America, the National Association of Broadcasters, NAB, uh, came up with a standard equalization for that they would use, that people would use for radio recordings, recordings that were going to be broadcast. And, and all of those, the, the characteristics of that EQ curve were meant to accommodate the limitations of recording tape in the early 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s, meaning you, the signal levels were relatively low, background noise was relatively high, but the problem of self erasure was worse than the background noise. So the NAB format attenuates high frequency on the recording side to keep the high frequencies from saturating the tape, causing self erasure, and then relinearizes it by boosting the high frequencies on the playback side. Right? The net effect of that is that it makes the tape noise sound brighter. So the tape noise on an NAB session sounds like a hiss, whereas the tape noise on a non-NAB session sounds like flat white noise. So the term tape hiss came into common vernacular because of the NAB EQ curve that was um, standardized in North America. Now, Europeans and the British and the Italians uh, came up with their own format, the, their, their own equalization standard. So all the broadcast unions in Europe used what was called the CCIR, or the IEC-1 EQ curve. And that is essentially flat in the high frequencies and nearly flat in the low frequencies. Um, they had better tape in Europe during those days. And um, in England in particular had really great tape. The EMI tape was the best recording tape in the 1960s. Um, so you can choose between those two EQ standards to further fine tune the behavior of the tape machine for a session. If you're extremely concerned about noise, then you would use the CCIR curve. If you were extremely concerned about high frequency self-erasure and saturation, then you would use the NAB curve. Um, 
In this case, this machine has NAB cards in it, so I'm using the NAB format. This is the best format in the studio. At our studios in Chicago, we tend to, tend to do everything at the CCIR cards. Um, okay, last thing about that. NAB, the NAB standard in North America, in Europe, they use a synonym for that. They use IEC 1 for the CCIR curve, and they use IEC 2 for the NAB curve. <laughs> so it's extremely dangerous to use the word, the, the abbreviation IEC, to describe yeah. the, because it could, you could get it wrong. So I always use the CCIR designation rather than the IEC designation. But on some machines, you'll see a switch that says IEC or NAB. And, uh, and on some machines, you see a switch that says IEC 1 or IEC 2. So that's what that means. Um, so I've made a little handout here. This is the, the box label that goes on the multi-track reel. And it shows all of the technical specs of, the, of this session. It shows that it's a 24-track session. It shows that uh, the, the formulation of the tape, that is the manufacturer model of the tape and, and formulation number of the tape. The reference level, the flexivity, that is that operating point that I was describing about whether you're recording at a high level or a low level. The operating point is described in, uh, there's a, a, a unit called the Weber, which is a degree of magnetic flux. And on tape, you describe the level that you're recording at in nanowebers, a millionth of a Weber, per meter squared. So if you had a square meter of that tape, there would be so much magnetic field on it. That's how you describe that. And the, the number for that, indicates how hot the recording is or how saturated the tape is. And we're using 500 nanowebers per meter, which is the standard for the tape formulation. Um, then it shows that I'm using the NAB EQ curve, and there's a special note on here. That there's two special notes. One is that track 24 wasn't working, so don't worry if there's nothing recorded on track 24. And the other one is that the, the reference tones, which you use at the beginning of the session to help calibrate the tape for future use, the reference tones were not printed simultaneously. If they were printed simultaneously, then you could use those to adjust the azimuth, which is a physical character for the machine. But if they're not printed simultaneously, then you can't, and it's important to tell a future engineer that you didn't print them simultaneously. So, um, and then we're not using any noise reduction on this session, so I've indicated no noise reduction. And then uh, as we fill out this reel, the box label will have a listing of all the songs that are on, the, on it. So when you pick up the box, you'll be able to tell precisely what kind of session it is, what songs are on there, what format the tape machine is, what I would need to do to mount the session on a future machine. So I'm gonna, you can pass, take one and pass that down. Um, so that's the tape machine, how the tape machine is set up for this session. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Yeah. Um, noise reduction, your yeah. thoughts about that maybe? Noise reduction, this is really interesting historical thing for me. Uh, noise reduction started to be considered at the dawn of the multi-track era, when tape machines went from being 8-track and 16-track, where the individual tape tracks were quite wide, and the background noise was then relatively low, because the, you had more oxide going by the tape, so you had more signal level relative to the background noise. When you started to get to 24-track formats like this, and then occasionally 48-track formats where people would have two multi-track machines, then th those tape tracks are much, much narrower. Um, and it's not a linear thing. So, um, do you have a whiteboard marker? Okay. So, um, here's the piece of tape, and then you're recording stri stripes of audio on there. So there's an audio track from there to there is one audio track. Then you need a little guide band between that track and the next track where there's nothing recorded, right? And then you put another audio track there, right? So there's an audio track and there's an audio track. So the, um, the earliest multi-track formats were one inch of tape with four tracks on it. So like all the Beatles, uh, Abbey Road recordings from the early 1960s were on Studer one-inch four-track machines. So you had very wide tape tracks and they had relatively no, low background noise because you had so much oxide going by on, per track, right? The one-inch format was then doubled to eight tracks. So you had eight tracks on one inch of tape, right? So when you double the number of tracks, 
you don't make each track half as big because you also have to include a guide band between each of these new tracks. So they, the tracks aren't half as big, they're less than half as big because you have the, the wasted space of the guide bands between them. So the background noise on the eight tracks was significantly worse, but there was a rapid development in tape formulations where by the mid 60s, you started to be able to record slightly hotter on the tape, so the background noise was being offset. Right? Same thing happened when they went from eight track to 16 track. So the 16 track tapes were two inches wide. So the per track noise was the, exactly the same as the one inch eight track format, but you had twice as many tracks. So the cumulative noise was worse. So people started to notice the background noise being a problem, but it wasn't egregious. Then when you take the two inch format and divide it even further to get 24 tracks instead of 16, 16 you don't just lose the fractional amount that you get by adding um, a third more track, is it a third more? Half the end more tracks. You also have all those extra guide bands which eat up even more space. So the, the track widths then were quite narrow. The per noise track relative to the audio was quite a bit worse and you had a lot more tracks. So when we, when we got to 24 track formats, the background noise got to be a real problem. It was a bigger problem in North America than it was in Europe because North America was still using the NAB tape format, which exaggerated the tape noise by making it into tape testing. So the earliest attempts at um, noise reduction used a, either a compounding system where the audio was compressed on the input so it could be recorded at a more, at a louder aggregate level on tape and then expanded on the output so, so you get the dynamic range returns at the end. Um, or used a two-way filter system where the audio was, the high frequencies were boosted on the input to the tape machine. So they were recorded at a hotter signal level and then the high frequencies were attenuated on the output so you get a linear, form, linear throughput but the perceived noise of the tape format was lessened by the, the, the dulling effect of the playback system. The, the thing that's really perverse about that is that that's the exact reverse of what the NAB system does. So what you would have the audio would be brightened artificially by the noise reduction system and then hit the NAB equalizer which would then attenuate the high frequencies and then it would be recorded and then the NAB circuit would boost the high frequency signals back up to linear and then the noise reduction system would attenuate the high frequencies again. So it, they essentially synthesized what the Europeans had been doing all along. This would be the IEC format, the CCIR format. So that was the Dolby system. The dynamic system was called uh, DBX, and uh, the, the problem with that is that when you compress the audio and then run it through a nonlinear system like a tape machine and then expand it, when you expand it, you exaggerate all of the nonlinearities of the system. So if you have frequency response nonlinearities, like let's say your high frequencies are plus or minus two dB within the system as a whole, at the output of the expander, if you've got a three to one expander, then your high frequency nonlinear is plus or minus six dB. So you right. really exaggerate the flaws or the nonlinearities of the system with the noise reduction. So um, a lot of those were addressed with a, a final generation of noise reduction systems. With, like there was one called Telcom C4, and there was one called, um, um, it's, I'm drawing a blank, Dolby SR. And those were a combination of dynamic filtering and equalization that was very finely tuned on both ends of the system, which meant that it never worked right and it always <laughs> sounded weird. Uh, and so, and all of this stuff was all done as a means of trying to make analog systems noiseless so that when they were compared to digital systems, they wouldn't look bad. Because the, the principal advantage of digital systems in the early era was that they were extremely no low noise. The sound quality wasn't great, the resolution wasn't great, but they had no tape hits. And so that was the single biggest perceived advantage of digital systems. So the analog engineers were all like viciously fighting the noise floor during the late 70s and early 80s, and that was, that was the arms race. Uh, now, with contemporary tape formats, like for the formula that we're using, which is um, SM900, made by a company called Recording the Masters, you can record at a relatively high level. So even on 24 tracks, and even with the NAB system, the background noise is not a, not a perceived problem. And if you're 
if I'm doing my job as an engineer, I should be managing the tracks such that you're not no, not aware of the noise. I shouldn't have a bunch of open tracks when there's no music on them. Right? My, I should be making sure that you're not listening to a bunch of noise. So, um, so I don't use noise reduction formats. I, don't, I, I, I have tried them on occasion, back, especially back in the early 80s when that was a big thing. And all of the flaws of them, all the nuisance problems of them, always seemed like a much much more pain in the ass than it was worth for the you know, and as soon as you take the standby off the Marshall, then the background noise is immaterial. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's why I don't do noise reduction. Um, before we get into the, the what I want, what I was going to do is, um, I was going to walk you through the studio and show you all the microphones that are set up on the on the band before the band come in to do a take. I wanted to just talk you through each of the microphones and tell you what everything is doing. Um, uh, if it can be intimidating to be in front of a group of other people, sort of professional peers, and admit that you don't know something, right? So, I, 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 if there was some way that I could encourage you all to ask the question that you don't want to ask in front of other people, feel free to come come at me privately in the hallway or something. I'm happy to show you, <laughs> and then, then I'll, I'll I'll bring it up as a general topic. <laughs> um, so is there anything else about this system? So th just, just to give you a brief rundown of the way the console is set up and the way everything is rigged here. Um, I'm not using any external mic preamps. All of the microphones are running through the console preamp, partly for simplicity, uh, because this, this studio doesn't often use the analog machine. We had to patch every part of that tape machine in separately. So that greatly encumbers the patch base. I didn't want to complicate things anymore by having a bunch of outboard stuff patched in as well. So we're just using the console mic preamps for everything. Um, but also, uh, I think the, while external, while, while very nice high quality mic preamps can make a difference, the differences that they make are quite subtle. And I didn't want to get lost in the weeds of all that stuff for a demonstration session. Um, and there are a lot of mics in play, and so the, the, the fewer things I have to fiddle with externally, the better. Um, so all of the mic lines from the studio come into the console on a per channel basis. And the top half of the channel strip here is dealing with those microphone signals. So there's a gain control, there's a polarity, there's a pad, there's phantom power, any of that nonsense that I need for each of the microphones. Then at the bottom of the channel strip, that knob controls the send of, of that microphone to the tape machine. And in some instances, I'm combining several microphones to one tape track. So it, it's conventional, I found, in digital sessions that when you have one microphone, that one microphone goes to one track in the, in the workstation, and then that one track stays discrete forever. In an analog session where you have limited tape resources, you'll have at maximum 24 tracks to, to play with. Um, it's much more common to do combining and submixing prior to recording, so that you'll take several microphones on one instrument and combine them to a single track which has that instrument on it. Um, and I did that principally for the drums on this session, and I'll show you all of those, 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 sub, those submixes and such. Um, I didn't end up doing it on any of, uh, well, I did on bass guitar as well, but I'll show, I'll show you all of that. Um, so then the, these knobs here, the bottom row of knobs, control the send from the desk to the multi-track. Then the return from the multi-track, that is the output of the tape track, comes back into the desk, and that's on these faders here. So on the upper legend strip here, ignore this illuminated, like the stock ticker up here. That doesn't have any significance. This upper tape legend here shows the microphone inputs as they're coming into the console. And this lower tape legend here shows you the returns from the multi-track and what these faders are. So um, the advantage of this is called inline operation. That is where you have a microphone coming in at the top of the channel. It's processed in the channel, sent out to the tape return tape machine. Then the return comes back in, and there's a separate tape return under that input. That's called inline operation. Um, there's another mode called split mode, where you have some channels that are used for microphones and other channels that are used for tape return. Um, I find this much more intuitive for me anyway, way of working where 
whenever I want to make the bass drum louder, I always grab the same fader. It's never, a, you know, it's not a different fader during the tracking than it is during the mixing, for example. Um, so, yeah, so that's how this is. There's a monitor section over here. A lot of this switching matrix stuff we're not using. We're really only using the stereo master here and then this monitor control pot here. And then there's a switch for going between different speakers. But a lot of the other stuff, like the, there's the effects returns and that sort of thing, but we're, we're not using any of that stuff on the console. Um, and then there's like this, the channel configurations on this, on most consoles, the channel configurations are done with switches on the channel. This console has a computer control of all of that stuff, so you have to call the individual channels up on the screen to adjust the channel configuration. But um, that probably won't change during the course of the session, so that's, that's, I'm not going to get into any of that. Um, so the patch bay, um, does every, can I see a show of hands? How many people use a patch bay on a regular basis? Okay, so I don't have to explain what a patch bay is. You guys understand that's the inputs and outputs of everything in the studio and you can connect them all together. Okay. Um, who wants to go look at microphones? Me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here, there's another handout here. These are the, um, these are the inputs to the console and the microphones, all the microphones. It's got the position of the microphone, the name of the microphone, and then any patch that's on it. So for the time being, I'm just gonna show you all of the microphones, and you can ignore the bit about the patches until we come back into the studio after we go ahead and take one of these and you pass them along. There are a couple of slightly unusual mic positions and placements out cool. there, um, which when we come back, I'll explain them out there, but when we come back in here, I'll do some diagramming on the whiteboard because it feels much more professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, head out in here, I'll show you everything. that and just tape it to the rim of the bass drum so it dangles down by the meter. Um, I do that quite often, um, but I was proud of that little gimmick, so I wanted to show it off. Um, so yeah, so there are another, you can also take a, a small microphone 
on a desk stand like this, you can have a directional microphone, um, like a dynamic microphone or a, another small condenser that can handle the signal level. You can put it on the floor, between the floor, some in the Tom and the bass drum pedal, for example. Um, there are a number of dif different ways you can do it, but I like to have a microphone on the batter side of the bass drum that's seeing the physical contact of the beater with the skin. And the advantage of that is that I can use that microphone in conjunction with the more conventional front of the bass drum microphone to add definition and bite to the bass drum. Um, it's, it's not uncommon that you'll find that a bass drum that sounds good when you audition the mic on its own, when the whole band is playing around it, doesn't have enough aggression, doesn't have enough clarity. And the, one of the impulses when you hear that, is to try to brighten that microphone up, give it a little bit more click or a little bit more attack. The problem with that is that, for example, if this was the only bass drum microphone, this microphone is out here in the world and it's immediately under these cymbals, so it's going to be hearing a lot of the trashy, noisy sound of the whole rest of the drum kit. And if I brighten that microphone up, then all of those trashy, noisy sounds get exaggerated. And so you end up with a kind of an awful sound of the, of the whole drum kit. Um, coming from the bass drum microphone. So the penalty you, play, you pay for trying to make the bass drum brighter is that the whole rest of the drum kit sounds kind of crappy. Um, so I, I quite like having a separate channel that's just that attack component so that I can add that into the bass drum um, sort of to taste. If I'm doing a 16 track session, which is quite often, um, then I'll combine those two onto one track that'll be just be labeled bass drum. Um, when I'm doing a 24 track session and there's more tracks to play with, I'll often separate that out so that the first track on the tape will be the batter side microphone, the second track on the tape will be the, the conventional front of the bass drum microphone. Now, this bass drum doesn't have a hole in it, um, which is um, not really, not, it, which can be a nuisance if you're in a live setting where there's a bunch of stage noise and, and you want to get a, a bass drum signal that lifts up over the rest of the band, um, you get much less isolation from that bass drum microphone than you would if you had it stuck inside the bass drum. In a setting like this where you have the amplifiers and stuff away from the drum kit, it's much less of an issue. Um, one subtlety about this particular bass drum microphone, this is the Bayer M380. It's a discontinued model, but the important feature of it is that it's a bi-directional microphone, meaning a figure eight pattern. So it, it has a front lobe and a, and a rear lobe, and there's a null uh, on, the, on the sides and the top. So immediately above this microphone is all this noisy, trashy cymbal stuff, and that's the least sensitive part of the polar pattern of this microphone. If this was an omnidirectional microphone, it would be picking all that stuff up. If it was a cardioid microphone, it would still have significant pickup from the side. But a figure eight microphone is picking up very little above and below and to the sides of that microphone. That's the, the deadest part of the microphone is the, the sort of plane that the microphone is in. So it's picking up much less of this ambient trashy noise in the room. Um, that microphone, if you if that microphone goes inside the bass drum, for example, if there's a hole in the bass drum, you stick that microphone inside the bass drum. One problem with having a microphone inside the bass drum uh, for purposes of isolation or for clarity, is that it, you get all of the reflected sound from the inside of the bass drum reflects back into the microphone. The figure eight pattern with the null then is slightly deaf to the reflections coming back from the sides of that bass drum. So you get a slightly cleaner, less, less tubular sound inside the, do you, do you understand what I mean? Like if your head's in a bucket, you can hear it. <laughs> like the, the figure eight pattern does a, a pretty good job of attenuating that problem if it's inside the bass drum. So I quite like that mic for bass drum. I use it all the time. We don't make them anymore, like most things that I like, but um, <laughs> they're, still, they're still available. And there are other figure eight microphones that you can use. There are other microphones of that description that you can use. Um, so you'll find this on a, a this, this will come up elsewhere on the drum kit as well, but you have one microphone on that side of the bass drum pointed that way. You have another microphone on this side of the bass drum pointed that way. So those two microphones are acoustically of opposite polarity. Like if this bass drum, if the column of air in the bass drum is moving back and forth this way, when it's moving toward this microphone, it's moving away from this microphone. So those two microphones are going to be acoustically out of phase with each other. And um, if you, and the biggest 
cancellation that you get in that sort of setup is low frequencies because the low frequency waves are the most collated between the two. The longer waveforms will be more out of phase. So when you, if you do a setup, of, if you do set this, something up like this, it's important to audition reversing the polarity of one or the other of the microphones to make sure that you've got a normalized polarity between the two. Um, and it's, it's, it's a relatively simple thing to do. You just flip the phase on the button with the phase picture on it. You flip that on one channel or the other until it sounds good and then leave it. You know. It might be the case that you prefer the sound of them being out of phase with each other. You know, from an aesthetic standpoint, you might prefer that sound. But generally speaking, I find that the low end sounds better and the bass drum as a whole sounds more natural if, the, if I normalize the polarities than those two. Um, because this microphone is picking up primarily the attack component and I'm not using it to support, support the low frequencies that much, I will sometimes even roll off the low frequencies on that using a high pass filter. And if I'm doing that, then the polarity matters much less. So, but it's still worthwhile to audition it to sort of polarity one way or the other. Did, and sorry, did you have to put the polarity on our, our uh, I did, yeah, I did. Which, which one is it? I flipped the one on the batter side. Right. So the one on the front side was normal. I, I just called that normal, I flipped the other one. Sure. Um, Okay, um, any questions about the bass drum? The physical distance from this front head um, is not critical. When you have a directional microphone, like a figure eight microphone, there's, an, there's a principle called the, the proximity effect, which is as the, closer, the microphone gets closer to the sound source, the low frequency response gets exaggerated because of the acoustic shadowing of the physical microphone. That is, the sound takes longer to get around the body of the microphone to get to the rear lobe of the microphone, uh, then so the closer it gets, the more you exaggerate the relative distance between the front and the back of the microphone, so the microphone gets more sensitive and you get more bass energy. Right? And the larger the microphone is, physically larger the microphone is, the greater that effect is. And the more bidirectional it is, the greater that effect is. So this is a bidirectional microphone, it's pretty big. So it has a hellish proximity effect. Like if you scoot it in very, very close, you get a ton of low end. If you back it off a couple of inches, the low end gets an awful lot softer. So um, I find that you can fine tune the low frequency energy in the bass drum just by scooting the microphone in or out a couple of inches. It makes a big difference. Um, it's not absolutely critical. It's not like there's one distance that sounds good, but I do think it's worthwhile to audition it moving it in and out. When the microphone is very close to this head, then you start to hear the individual modes of vibration on the drum head, and you'll find that the sound is quite different from one position to even a few inches away around the perimeter of the, of the drum head, and that's because there are a lot of geometric modes on the drum head that will ex ex accentuate one frequency or another. So I think it's, you know, it's risky or it's, it's more demanding if you have a microphone very, very close to the head, because then you have to be listening to all these different modes and moving around until you find the right spot. I just don't have that much time. I'm an old man, I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, that microphone, the front microphone is going through a peak limiter, the 1176, and I have that set so that um, on the firm strokes, it's doing about four to six dB of attenuation, and on the soft strokes of the bass drum, it's doing not much. So, and that, the main reason that I'm doing that is I'm sort of, normalizing the intensity of the stronger strokes of the bass drum while still having some dynamic range in the bottom end of the, of the, of the plane. Um, uh, yeah, so a couple of other subtleties about this batter side microphone. This batter side microphone here is also directly underneath the snare drum. So every time it hits the snare drum, there's like a blast of no snare drum noise that hits into that batter side microphone. And that, more often than not, makes the snare drum sound bad. So I've set up a patch, which I've described on the thing, which I'll demonstrate for you in the control room, where there's a ducker. A ducker is a dynamic device that's the opposite of the gate. Uh, a ducker set up on this batter side microphone so that um, every time Barry hits the snare drum, the signal going through the snare drum microphone triggers the ducker and it attenuates that batter side microphone. So when he's hitting the snare drum, that microphone is attenuated. Um, and when he's not hitting the snare drum, and most often, most of the time, 
the snare drum and bass drum are not played simultaneously. I mean, barring ACDC, it's rare that you hear the bass drum and snare drum played simultaneously. But when they are, the fact that you're losing the attack component of the bass drum doesn't really matter because it would be overshadowed by the snare drum anyway. So, um, but the main advantage of it is that it cleans up the gaps in between the beats. Like you don't hear this black of noise coming off the snare drum every time you hit the snare drum. Um, uh, that's an accommodation that I figured out after a while. Like I started doing that on the batter side and I liked it, but then it started, then there was the penalty you paid for it with the snare drum sounded bad, so I started going through the, like trying to figure out how to make the snare drum not sound bad, and that's what I came up with. Um, okay, so the snare drum, moving on to the snare drum. Does anybody have any more, any questions about the bass drum? Go. Sorry, uh, just the position of the mic. So, uh, sometimes you can find a bass drum will have a little bit more low end off to one side and not the middle of yeah. the drum. And is that something that you've, is that something? Is that in uh, the world? Or? I, I, don't have a, I don't have a really hard and fast rule. I start yeah. in the middle just because it's, it's easy okay. to remember. Right. And um, one side or the other might sound better. Okay. And if it doesn't sound good when I listen to it, then I'll come and move it around. Mm -hmm. Or move, uh, more often, I'll listen with my ear and see if there's a spot that sounds better, and I'll put the microphone there. Um, but bear in mind, if you're moving it to the side, you're, what you're doing, it's a circle, right? Yeah. So you're moving it to the side. You're moving it eccentrically. It doesn't matter if you're moving it up or down or left or right. You're uh -huh. still moving it eccentrically. So if it's in the middle and lower, that's the same as being in the yes, middle to the opposite side. side. So yeah, um, so yeah uh, and uh, I, I will admit to a, a, a very slight um, Asperger tendency that makes me want to put the bass drum mic in the middle. Ooh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you know, so I accommodate this like mild autism by like putting it in the middle because that's where it looks. I, right. I was just worried about like I was wondering if if, that, if uh, phase entered into why that was right in the middle or not? No, you know, my, my suspicion is that when you're moving it, it, it off center, if you move it off center and it sounds better, that's probably because the center is a dead spot because of the overlapping edge modes right. of the vibration, right? But it, it's a purely random effect that the center would happen to be dead. It's like, because the modes are not consistent because the tuning's not gonna be 100% consistent. So it might sound better eccentrically, it might sound better in the middle. But my experience has been, there's a kind of a trend lately for people who put a hole in their bass drum to have the hole off, off to one side, yes. like yeah. the eccentric hole. I'm not into that at all. Okay. I, I really, I find, that, I find that distracting to look at. <laughs> and also I, th I think it sounds weird. Like if you just tap the resonant head of the bass drum, or if you just play the bass drum, the bit around the hole sounds really weird because it's like got um, uh, really odd stresses on the head all around that, that hole. So my experience has been that if you're gonna put a hole in the bass drum, it generally sounds better if you put the hole in the middle. Right. Um, because then you sort of centralized all the stresses and you're, you know, I prefer a small hole to a big hole, but if there's gonna be a hole, I prefer the hole to be in the middle. And I also don't, there's a thing that people do now where they put these weird little gaskets around the hole as oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. what's that about? I don't know. I, 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 have, I don't, I think it's to, to make sure that the, when somebody puts a microphone in there, uh, they don't rip that the they head. don't rip the head. I, that's perfectly. I think painful. that's all that. Yeah, is. I think that's fine. But I've had the opposite. I'm a drummer, and I've been all my life, and uh, I, I I think my bass drum sounds better when the hole is is off to the side. Oh, all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm. Uh, we have a, a bunch of drum kits at the studio. Yeah. And so we have to we've gone through a lot of iterations of experiment and sort of settled on having the hole in the middle because every time we put it on the, made it eccentric, it was harder to tune and it, and it sort of sounded odd. And uh, yeah, uh, we've sort of standardized on having the hole near, in the middle or near the middle, yeah. not necessarily dead in the middle, but near the middle. Um, and also it's, there's, a, there's another slight subtlety about that, the bi-directional microphone. If the bi-directional microphone is inside the bass drum, yeah then the back pattern is hearing the resonant head. Yeah. So the front of the microphone is hearing the batter side and the column of air moving past it. And the back of the microphone is hearing the resonant head, right? So the resonant head tends to matter quite a bit even if the microphone is inside the bass drum. So, and I found like I get the most consistent or most repeatable tuning effect if the hole is in the middle. If the hole's off to one side, then it seems much more difficult for me to get it in tune. And because the resonant head is picking up 
significantly with the bidirectional microphone, then the tuning of the resonant head matters. So. I'm, I'm normally using a hypercardioid inside and a sub kick on the outside, so I want as much um, head mm -hmm. in that sub kick mode. That's why, that, and that's just what, what I like to do. Would you ever take the resonance to know? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. so if the guy wants a really dry, really dead sound, like that's, there was a characteristic sound of a lot of studio recordings in the 70s where there were, you know, bass drums were tuned quite low and they were very dead and very padded and they didn't have much of a front head on them and it had a, a very dry, very short, very dead sound. And uh, you can do that just by deadening the resonant head, but it's much easier to just take the head completely off. Yeah. Okay. Um, lowers the volume the, the bass drum. Bass drum tends to get more percussive, but um, it's not as loud without the resonant head. Um, so the acoustic sound in the room tends to be a little bit more like a door knock and less like a boom. Okay. Um, so if you're, if you're using significant ambient sound, then not having a front head tends to sound slightly odd because you have this sort of hard, brittle sound in the ambient track. But um, if you're going for a dead sound like that, you're probably not going to be using much ambience anyway. So that, yeah, that's, that, I, I find that quite useful as well. Um, yes. Any other bass drum questions? Okay. The snare drum is a condenser mic small condenser microphone. It's an Octava MK012 with a cardioid pattern capsule on it. There's a minus 10 pad under the capsule. That's to keep the head amplifier of the microphone itself from overloading. Um, uh, I have experimented with a bajillion microphones on the snare drum, and uh, I was n distinctly unsatisfied for a very long time, and then I found a small number of microphones that I did like on the snare drum. This is a fairly recent one. I brought this one along just because it's, I think it sounds quite good, and it's also a very pedestrian microphone. You can buy them at a guitar shop for like 100 bucks. And I think they sound great on snare drum. The low end on them is really good, makes the snare drum sound quite heavy. Um, and I find that I have the most trouble with snare drum not getting them to be crisp or have a lot of attack, but to get them to have the sort of body and impact that you expect. Like, um, I find the crispness of a snare drum is generally pretty well represented in the close mics and also in the overheads and the rest of the drum kit. But the sort of physical thud of the snare drum is the part that I have the hardest time capturing. I quite like small diaphragm condensers. Uh, there's some Altec tube microphones called the 165 and 175. I use those a lot. There's a Sony condenser microphone called the C37. I use that on snare drum a lot. Um, before I started, I gravitated toward almost exclusively using condenser microphones on the snare drum. I came up with a gimmick that I used a lot in the 80s and the early 90s where I had a dynamic microphone like a Bayer 201 with a small condenser microphone like one of these Shure FM98s, for example, taped to the side of it. So you had two microphones pointed at the same spot of the drum and the capsules sort of aligned. And then I would balance those inside this control room, summing them to one track. And I found that, that the sound of, those, of two microphones together had more low end, more body, more sort of thickness than either one of them by itself. And the composite sound of them uh, was different than what I had, would imagine as a blend of the two. It sounded, and, and I, I, I think I may have figured out why. Like in the, if you look at the spectrum, the frequency response uh, of each of the microphones, the bit where they're the most similar is going to be in the low frequencies. And then in the high frequencies, they're going to be sort of spiky and random and quite different from each other. So when you take the two microphones and sum them together, the high frequencies are not going to sum that much. Um, there will be interaction between those, and there'll be some spike and some uh, null. But generally speaking, the high frequency content stays about the same relative to the rest. But all the low frequency stuff is going to reinforce. So you get a thicker, heavier sound from having those two microphones mixed together. Um, so I did that for a long time, and then I found that if I was, you know, just through experimentation, I found a number of single microphones that I thought sounded just as good as a combination of microphones, and, and it's easier to plug in one microphone than two, so I do that a lot. Do you have a problem with hi hats going into the condenser mics and crazy sound? Um, that's an inescapable problem of recording a drum kit: is that the hi hat is typically quite close to the snare drum. 
Um, it's actually, I mean, this isn't bad. Uh, the, the real crippler is when the, the hi-hats are physically out over the top of the snare drum and very, very down, low down towards the snare drum. That's really, really hard to get away from. Like, I, I find that to be the most intrusive. You may notice there's not a hi-hat microphone, a mm -hmm. specific hi-hat microphone. I generally don't use a hi-hat microphone. Um, I will if the drummer is like particularly flashy on his hi-hat and or particularly wants a hi-hat microphone for peace of mind or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but more often than not, if there was such a thing as a negative microphone <laughs> that you could put on something that sucked the sound off the record, I would put one on the hi-hat. <laughs> yeah. um, hi-hat, I've always sort of thought of hi-hat as like the, like the gravy uh, on your meatloaf supper. Like you don't order the gravy, gravy separate, it just comes. <laughs> you order meatloaf and you get gravy. <laughs> and that's sort of the way hi-hat works. Like you have all these microphones open around the drum kit and they're all, like the hi-hat is just pissing on all of them. <laughs> so you, you can't, there's not, you don't have a great degree of control of the hi-hat. Like, and that's just an, a, a, a part of the acoustic problem. Um, there are a number of things you can do if the hi-hat is really abrasive, like if you're listening to playback in the hi-hat, like the, and it's, it's also to do with the, the degree of skill that the drummer exerts, right? Barry's quite good, so if he's not hitting the hi-hat harder than the snare drum, which is a problem with a lot of drummers just learning how to play, um, they tend to hit the hi-hat harder than the snare drum, or when they're playing hard, or playing fast, this is the biggest problem. In order to hit the snare drum, they have to get the hi-hat hand out of the way quickly, which means then the hi-hat hand is moving very fast, which means when he hits the hi-hat, he hits the hi-hat a lot harder than he needs to. So, um, so uh, for thrash stuff and like hardcore drummers and things like that, the hi-hat tends to be like really intrusive. And, in, and also in that scenario, um, the drummer's hands are crossed and so he doesn't have a full swing on the snare drum, so the snare drum's gonna be quiet and that sort of compounds the problem. Like you have to bring up the gain on the snare drum and that brings up the bleed on the hi-hat and then you know, you're just fucked all around. But really, there are a couple of things that you can do. Um, Barry, do you mind if I move your hi-hat? No, well, sure. Okay. Um, if you throw some coins or keys, like a set of keys, inside the hi-hat, then that deadens the bottom head some. And also, I feel like the sound of them jingling around in there is actually kind of nice. I don't know. I don't know. Not as spitty sounding. 
Um, also, I found that shittier hi hats don't have as much high, aren't, aren't as bright. Like these are zildjian, that's a, a, a proper make, right? But there are also, you know, like the department store symbols that are like the off brand kind, they're, you know, very flexible and trashy. Like those don't last, like they tend to get rippled and tend to crack and tend to sound quite bad if you just listen to them, but they're not as loud. And so um, if that's an issue, um, you, it's, it's worth it to keep some crappy hi-hats around just for that, around the studio, just for that, for that purpose. Um, but again, I, I would never insist on anything like that. I would, I would only do those kind of things if everyone agreed that there was a problem and there was something we had to do about it. Th those are some things you can do. If the drummer is okay with it, you can try raising the hi-hat so they're physically a little bit farther away from the snare drum microphone. But that changes the angle of attack, changes the way they have, have to play, and generally speaking, drummers are pretty set in their ways about the physical layout of the drum kit, and that's how they, like, that's part of their playing style is the way the drum kit set up, so I, I tend not to mess with that if I can if, if I can avoid it. Um, I have noticed, though, just as a general thing, the higher the cymbals are, or the higher the hi-hat in particular, relative to the snare drum, the better the drummer is. <laughs> it might be a prejudice on my part that has less of a problem, but like when I think of my favorite drummers, like my favorite drummers, all of them the high hats up by, up by their eyebrows, almost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so that's the snare drum. I don't often use a bottom mic on the snare drum. Um, there, there are times that I will do it yeah. are when the snare drum is exceedingly deep. Like this is a six inch snare drum, five and a half inch, six inch. Do you know? Yes, six. six. Yeah, so that's in the totally normal range of s snare drum. If it was an eight inch or 10 inch deep, like a marching drum, something like that, where the snare wires on the strainer are a long way from the microphone on the top, um, the acoustic sound in the room is gonna be a, a pretty even blend of the top mic and the strainers, but the mic on the top is not gonna be hearing the strainers that well. So in a situation like that, just to make it sound more natural relative to what you're used to hearing acoustically, I'll use the bottom side mic as well. And again, you run into the same scenario where you have two mics pointed in opposite directions, and so one of them is going to be out of phase with the other, and I would tend to normalize the polarity of the bottom microphone by flipping the face on it. Um, when you have a mic on the bottom side, that mic will tend to pick up a lot of the sort of buzzing and fizzling from when the drummer's playing the toms. Um, a way around that is to use an expander on the bottom side microphone. Um, and uh, key the expander using the top side microphone so that when the drummer hits the, the skin and the mic on the top hears the stick attack on the top skin, then the expander opens up on the bottom mic and you hear the bottom strainers come through. I, I find that very useful. If I'm using a bottom side microphone and, I'm, and it's buzzing when he's rolling around the toms, for example, you can get rid of a lot of that by using a keyed expander for the bottom side microphone, keying it from the top mic. Um, if you notice that sort of buzzing effect from playing the toms and buzzing the snare drum, uh, it's almost impossible to get rid of that in the other microphones in the room. So if that becomes a significant acoustic problem in the room as a whole, then you should stop and reach in the snare drum or tighten the snare wires or retune the tom or which it, if there's one tom that's exciting it more than the other, maybe retune that one drum slightly higher or slightly lower so that it's not exciting the snare drum. Um, but there are some snare drums that are so sensitive that no matter what you're hitting, like you hit the bass drum or either of the toms, it's going to fizzle. And there, that's just part of the sound of the kit, and you just have to live with it. Any questions about the snare drum? I have a general question. I mean, does the size of the room determine which microphones you keep? Uh, if you were in a small, yes and no. smaller dead room, if it's in an extremely dead room, then uh, there are a number of accommodations. Like generally speaking, in a dead room, you want to have. Uh, I tend to prefer the drums to not be as resonant in a dead room, because the acoustic sound, uh, like the reflected energy in the room, tends to smooth out the sound of the resonances of the drum kit. So when you hit the floor tom, it goes boom. That sounds big and round, and it's exciting in the room. But when you're in a really dry, really focused environment, and you hit the floor tom and it goes boom, it just sounds <laughs> odd and weird because you're hearing it in more detail. Okay. So I tend to prefer deader tuning 
on the drums in a dry environment. This room is sort of medium live, and I, so I feel like a, a wide range of sounds are going to sound okay in this room. I, I think it's a pretty good sounding room in general. And so whether the drums are dry or, or really heavily dampened, these are pretty well dampened, or whether they're wide open, that's more of a matter of taste for the drummer, right? But if the, if the recording is going to have a very dry aesthetic on the drums, I tend to prefer much deader sounding drums, like a, a short percussive bass drum, a crisp dry snare drum, and a you know, less rainy, less sustaining tom. Okay. So that's the biggest difference that I notice. And also, like, um, we'll get to this in a minute, but I'm, I have ambient microphones in the room. <coughs> on the floor over there, under the bass drum, uh, under the bass guitar stand, there's one ambient microphone on the left side. And then on the right over here, on the floor over by that mic panel, under that other mic stand there, that's another ambient microphone on the right side of the room. <coughs> so those ambient microphones are picking up the, res like the reflected sound inside the room. And in a dead environment, I might not use ambient microphones like that. I might, if, they, if they're with a big enough size that you could get some physical distance on the drums. But generally speaking, in a, in a super dead room, you're not worried about the room acoustics so much. You're just trying to get a focused close-up sound of the drums, so the ambient mic's much less of an issue. I, I tend to let, worry about those a lot less. Um, I used to have a... A, a studio in a, uh, before I built electrical audio, I was in a bungalow in, in Chicago, and I had a, a studio in that bungalow. And we used the basement as a recording area, and the attic as the control room. So the, the basement, the ceiling was quite low, like seven feet or something like that. Um, and when we first, when I first started making recordings in there, it sounded awful. Um, and so I deadened the ceiling a lot. I used a lot of uh, used foam padding on the ceiling and fabric over the top of it. And I found just that one thing, getting rid of the reflections from the closest plane, that is the, the low ceiling, made the basement sound bigger. Like getting rid of the, the closest reflections made the farther reflections more audible. Um, so even though I had deadened the room, the room sounded bigger and sounded slightly live. Or sound, still sounded live, but it sounded slightly bigger because I had gotten rid of the closest reflections. Uh, and you notice I've done something similar here. Like in the center of a room, there tends to be what's called a standing wave, where there's a single mode or a single frequency that's reinforced by the planar reflections between the floor and the ceiling. So if you can break up that planar reflection either by tilting the ceiling during the construction or by using louvers to break up the planar reflection or doing something like this, some kind of accommodation to, to the center of the room to kill the reflections off the center of the room, then the more distant reflections become more audible because they're not overwhelmed by the shortest re reflections. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the tom. The tom toms, you'll notice both the rack tom and floor tom have two mics, one on the top, one on the bottom. Um, this is a sort of normal working distance for me, three to five inches away. Um, notice this one's shifted slightly, so I'm gonna keep that back in here. And yeah, the <coughs> the mic on the bottom. Um, I try to make the the microphones not perfectly parallel, but a, a pro approximating parallel to the planar movement of the drum head. Um, I found that that tends to give you more tends to give me more body and more sustaining tone from the drums and less the sort of clacky attack sound. And for the snare drum, having a, a slightly oblique angle is, is good because you get a nice sharp stick attack sound. Um, but for the toms, I tend to feel like the attack is very well represented in almost every circumstance. What we lose in a lot of situations is the sort of weight or the, the pitch of the, of the tom. And um, I found that having, a, uh, having the diaphragm of the microphone more parallel to the planar movement of the, of the drum head tends to help with that. Like you get less, like the balance is less of the stick attack and more of the sort of sustaining sound of the drum. And that's true, so the, the mic on the top and the bottom are, are both approximating parallel to the, to the drum head. When I get a microphone here, and I'll show you one little thing here. <coughs> 
that I pointed in the spot. So, um, I just want to point out a nice practical aspect of these microphones. These microphones are a side address condenser microphone, meaning the capsule is here and it's looking that way at the drum. Um, and th they're, because they're side address, there's no big thing here physically looming in front of the drummer. And there's a relatively small target here for the drummer to hit. Right? And this microphone is sticking out fairly well this way, but there's nothing up here for, to interfere with the drummer's hand or his movement toward the cymbals or between the, between the drums or whatever. Um, I just want to point out how much different it would be if I was using mics like this, which are conventional floor tom or tom tom microphones, and you see how much bigger of a target that is, and how much more in the way, sort of physically in the way, and physically imposing it is to have something like that in there. And then if I were to try to fit one of these under the floor tom, for example. There's no room to get that mic under there and also plug a cable into it. So um, this form factor, the side address condenser microphone, is perfect for this application. Um, these microphones are made by a guy named David Josephson. The model number is P22S, but there are other microphones of this similar form factor. There's an audio technical microphone called the 4050, I think. Um, uh, or 450, I forget. But it's not as physically robust as this, but it's a sim similar side address small diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, there's the AKG 451, uh, uh, sorry, AKG 414, which is a um, sort of paddle shaped microphone that similar form factor, slightly larger, but side address condenser. It, it'll work in this capacity. There's an older AKG microphone called the 451 that was a pencil microphone that had uh, an adapter that you could put under the capsule that allowed you to bend the capsule at 90 degrees. And so that would do the same, basically the same thing. So um, these microphones, I was involved in the design of these microphones and, and this was that aspect of it, that it is a side address condenser microphone was specifically for this purpose, so that you could get mics in on the top and the bottom of the drum kit without them being physically um, imposing on the drummer, physically in the way. Uh, yeah, so same deal with these. You have one mic on the top, one on the bottom. They're gonna be acoustically out of phase with each other, so you reverse the polarity of one of them. This is a really odd thing that I found. Um, when I'm reversing the polarity to normalize the polarity, I tend to listen with all of the mics of the drum kit open. Like, start with the bass drum, get the bass drum sounding good, add the snare drum, get the snare drum sounding good, add the rack tom, get the rack tom sounding good, add the floor tom, get the floor tom sounding good, and then audition reversing the polarity of the various pairs. So um, I found that it's essentially random which one sounds better being reversed, whether I reverse the polarity of the top microphone or the bottom. And in a lot of instances, it'll sound better if I reverse the bottom of the rack tom and the top of the floor tom for some reason. I have no idea why that is, but it's a pretty consistent thing. Like, um, like uh, by consistent, I mean, there's no way for me to predict which one is gonna sound better. I, I still have, I just have to audition it and figure out which one of them sounds better. And I don't, I couldn't even tell you what I mean by sounds better. Just like, <laughs> like when the guy's playing, I'll audition it one way and audition it the other way and I'll prefer one of them and I'll leave it that way. So um, there's no rule of thumb about whether you reverse the polarity of the top or reverse the polarity of the bottom. When, when you're auditioning the phase, do you leave other microphones on? Yeah, when you're we're listening to the whole drum. The whole yeah, listening to, I mean, I'll, I'll do it with him playing individual drums, but with all the other microphones on. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll also like audition it while he's playing the whole of the drum kit. I'll flip those mics around and see if it improves improves or affects the sound of the whole drum kit. Okay. So, um, okay. So, yeah. any questions about the um, you, Sorry, did you find the, the, the small diagram, the, the, that first attack, and uh, uh, is that why you guys went with that, with that mm -hmm. design? No, it's weird. I've actually used 
I, I'm sort of equally happy with small or large diaphragm condensers on the comms. Okay. I've used the, before I had these microphones, I used to use the AKG 451s. And those are small diaphragm mics, yeah. right? And then I also used to use AKG 414. Those are large diaphragm mics. And I didn't have a preference between them. I slightly preferred the 451s because they're less expensive and they would get broken. <laughs> so, but other than that, I had no real preference between them. Um, so I don't think the capsule, the capsule size on a condenser microphone, the capsule size, the biggest differences that that makes uh, are in the in the noise floor uh, and at the very bottom end of the of the dynamic range, the, the, it affects the noise floor because you have a physically larger um, uh, membrane, the, so the capacitive changes are audible to a, down to a quieter degree so that you need less gain on the amplifier. Super esoteric stuff. Um, I had a long conversation about the size of the diaphragm with David Josephson, and uh, you know, there's a sort of perceived thing about the bigger microphones having better bass response. and. Yeah. That's absolutely not true. Like the the microphones on the floor are um, uh, they use a nickel diaphragm made by the Microtech Excel company, and the diaphragm on those is a half inch, right? And the bass response on those goes down to about eight hertz. Like it's fantastic bass response. The size of the diaphragm does not affect, except in certain odd and extreme cases, doesn't really affect the frequency response at the low frequencies that much. It changes the the polar pattern at high frequencies, because you can have a slight phase difference across the, the larger diaphragm at high frequencies, so you get slight lobing and spiking in the frequency response pattern on the hard, large diaphragm. So the high frequencies tend to be slightly more nonlinear with large diaphragm. Uh, but um, the biggest difference is that the, the it's easier to tension a, a large diaphragm, if a plastic diaphragm, it's easier to tension a big sheet and then clamp it than it is to fiddly tension, very small thing. So, um, so yeah, so it's manufacturing consideration of okay. a couple of those things. But yeah, um, so I like the physical size being small again, because it's like a smaller yeah. size. Yeah. Uh, but these microphones are really robust. I don't know if you can see yeah. that. These are scarred as hell. Like they've been whacked a lot. Yeah. And they haven't really changed the sound of them. But I mean, th they're super durable. Um, and these, these on the tops are prototypes that were made prior to the actual production run. And then that's the one, the one on the bottom here. I don't know if you can see this. It's got a slightly different profile. Like the this bit is a little bit fancier. It's a little bit, a little bit nicer machining, yeah. and, and it's even thicker than that. It's even heavier than this. This, this wall is maybe an eighth of an inch thick. That's maybe like you know yeah. a quarter of an inch thick. Or that's the one you see in shops. Yeah. 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 What kind of price are these, Michael? How much? What? How, what kind of price? Uh, good question. I want to say 1200 1500 bucks, which seems like a lot. Yeah, that's a really bad thing about this mic. This mic, by the way. Is it very expensive? If you get one, you want more. <laughs> <laughs> I worked in a studio where we had, like, where the guy bought two, and he was like, well, they sound good on top and bottom. I always travel with some of the little blue gummies because those are, are useful. I, 
I don't actually find them that useful on ponds. I find them very useful on snare drum. Like if you get one weird little twang on the snare drum, you can put one of those little blue gummies on there and it tends to go away quite efficiently. Um, this snare drum I thought sounded fine all by itself. And uh, Barry set the toms up the way he likes them and I'm happy with that. That's, you know, he, that's none of my business. You didn't by chance get the heat gun, did you? No, I was just thinking about okay. it. Mm -hmm. it. There's, a little, there's a little gimmick I want to tell you about. These tom heads are dimples. <coughs> Pardon me. These are single ply heads and they have little dimples in them, right? And that's from the point of the stick coming down uh, rather than the side flat of the stick hitting the head. And that those little dimples, when the head is vibrating, those little dimples can pop in and out and create weird little resonances and little buzzes and stuff. So it's a good idea to shrink, to get rid of those dimples if you can. And the, the easiest way to do it is to take one of those heat guns that are used for shrinking heat, heat shrinkable insulation on cabling and stuff. Take one of those heat guns and play it over the head in a, in a fashion where you're evenly heating the head. And the mylar, uh, the plastic that the heads are made out of, has a physical memory. So when you heat it up, it shrinks back to the way it was when it came rolling off the mill. And so all those little dimples go away. There is a kind of a roadie trick where you turn the drum upside down and heat it up with a big lighter, but that <laughs> takes a lot of time because you have to heat each individual dimple up by itself. <laughs> it's kind of a pain in the ass. And there's a slightly more showbiz way of doing that, which is where you pour high proof rum on it and set it on fire. <laughs> 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 um, <Poor> waste. <laughs> That's also not as efficient and occasionally causes fire. So, um, but yeah, um, so the little dimples on here hasn't really affected the sound of it that much. I, I thought they sounded okay when we, were when we were auditioning them earlier. If I noticed that it was a problem, uh, then like our studio, we have a heat, we have a, in our tech shop, we have a heat gun and I'm regularly running up to the shop and stealing the heat gun from Greg and coming down and shrinking the drum out of it. That's also, it's also quite nice when you have just changed the heads on the drums, when you have brand new heads on there and they're stretching and they're sort of, the tensions on the drum are kind of uneven. If you heat the whole surface of the head, it evens out the tensions all the way across because the, the stresses kind of move when the, while the head is soft on, from the un, under heat and then it sort of stabilizes again. Mm -hmm. So I found that is also very useful. Like if, if you're, when you've changed the heads on the drum, if they're slightly irregular and slightly erratic sounding, if you just heat up the whole surface of the head and then let it cool back down to normal, it tends to even it out a little. You still need to fine tune the tuning, but it, it <coughs> does even out the stresses in the head slightly. And I, I found out, totally by accident, I found out that there are some drum manufacturers that do that to their drums before they ship them, mm -hmm. um, which might be why some people think, you know, like, oh, the drums always sound great in the shop, and then you get them home and they sound awful, you know? Like, like uh, that might be that when they come out of the box, they've had that had that done to them. You probably found them too. Uh, if you try to like the Alps or something, you get to the next step and it can be super cold. The drum yeah. sounds yeah. awful. Yeah. yeah. Huh. They must be like the opposite. Yeah. There you go. Sorry, you never know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, there are a couple of different tuning regimes as well. I don't know if you guys. Uh, this is kind of a digression. I don't know if you want to get into it because it's. Uh, um, I, but I just love hearing myself talk. <laughs> so um, there are sort of three standard ways of tuning resonant drums like tom toms. Um, if you tune the top head and the bottom head to the same pitch or per, near, nearly the same pitch, then you get a long sustaining sound, and it's, you get a sort of a clean note like a boom, dong kind of a sound, right? If you tune the bottom head slightly higher than the top head then it's a, you get a rising pitch on the sustain and it sort of chokes off the sustain so you get a shorter sound that also sort of rises slightly and that and I'll, I'll onomatopoeticize that with my mouth 
the output level at that force field may be quite low. So uh, the convention is to, if you're using ribbon microphones on the overhead, on the overhead, to use shelving equalizer to roll, to, to, to like brighten up the high frequencies, or to use a high pass filter to roll off the low frequencies, and so you're just hearing the mid range and high frequency components of the mic. And that's what I've done. I've used a low frequency. I use a high pass filter on these. Um, one thing I've noticed about the spaced overheads like this is that the snare drum tends to dominate the sound of the cymbals in the overhead mic. Um, and the way I have gotten around that, the way, the way I've um, dealt with that, is by using a very fast acting peak limiter on the overhead mic. close up snare drum sound, it's this kind of phasey, slightly distant off axis snare drum sound. So I, I tend to like using the peak limiter and when the when the drummer's hitting the snare drum full on, the peak limiter tends to be attenuating about six or eight decibels. So it's not dramatic, it's not like, not like 20 decibels or anything like that, but it is, it's a significant attenuation. It's like if you were to duck it with your finger, it's about how much you would be ducking it if you were doing it by choice. Um, <clears throat> So that's, these two microphones are being sung with the stereo microphone that's stereo set that's in front of the drum kit. So that is picking up the sort of general stereo image of the drum kit. And these microphones are adding the extra cymbal brilliance to that. Um, these microphones are on this side of the drum kit. Those microphones are on the back side of the drum kit. So again, they're acoustically out of polarity with each other. And it's worth it to audition reversing the polarity of one or the other set to make the drum kit as a whole sound more normal. And in this case, I think I've reversed the polarity of these guys rather than that guy. And the balance between the two I set by ear. Like I don't use the meters or anything to set the, the balance between the two. Um, but I get the impression that it's about an even balance in that stereo pair. So there's a stereo channel, there's two tracks that are a stereo image. That stereo microphone plus these two outrigger microphones. Um, and you know, I just balance them by ear. And then so the close mics on the drum give you on the drums give you the definition of the individual drums. The general stereo image of the drum kit and the sort of noisy top of the drum kit sounds, the cymbals and the attack sounds and the rims and that sort of stuff, tends to come from that stereo microphone. And then the additional brilliance of, for the cymbals tends to come from these outrigger microphones. And I just adjust all of that by ear, and that's how I, uh, how I arrive at those levels to take. Um, oh yeah, one other thing. This octava microphone, is Russian. And I don't know if this is true of all Russian microphones, but this microphone is electronically of opposite polarity of other microphones. And so you have to normalize that polarity if you're going to be using that in combination with other microphones. So, <clears throat> for example, if you have, uh, if you're list using, uh, it, it's not uncommon for me to use two microphones on something like a guitar amplifier, where I'll have a bright microphone and a dark microphone, and I'll balance them against each other. If you're using that as the bright microphone, and then a, a ribbon microphone or, or a dynamic microphone as the darker microphone, and you try to sum them, you'll get cancellation because the that microphone is opposite polarity electronically. So you have to normalize it one, one way or the other. Um, in our whole studio, we have hundreds of microphones. That's the those are the only microphones that operate that way. All of our other microphones have either been normalized 
by somebody else, or they were made that way in the first place. There is an IEC standard for microphones, which is rearward movement of the diaphragm or positive air pressure on a membrane gives you positive voltage on pin two of the XLR connector. And this microphone, that same condition gives you positive voltage on pin three of the microphone instead of pin two. It's, it's worth it if, if you find that you have an oddball microphone like that, it's worth it to either make note of it so that you always get it right at the desk or rewire the microphone if it's a simple thing. If there's a transformer, you can just swap the leads to the output connector and normalize it. Um, I haven't even looked in this microphone. I don't know if it has a transformer or not. So. I've had a pair of them for 10 years and I didn't even know that. <laughs> Have you ever tried to use them with other microphones and thought, oh, that No, could, not really. I've always kind of kept a pair with the yeah. two, I suppose. So I, 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 have, I have a pair of them as well, and I, I used to put one on the underside of my snare drum. Oh, and, yeah. and, and I would do that thing of flip, flipping the phase <laughs> on the underside, and go, well, that's worse. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> and, and I never, well, I never even you. imagined that did it, it was... For you. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's a big, big time saver. <laughs> Think of all the time you've saved and you don't have to push that button. Yeah. Cool. Um, did you flip the phaser or not? I did. Yeah. yeah. So I noticed that uh, we talked yesterday, yesterday about using sort of higher stands and you said you prefer an Agoda. Yeah. The first thing that strikes, that struck me when you were setting up. You so know, do you I, find the phase, this is easier for phase? I, I, I prefer to set up this way as of late. Um, I don't know why, but I, can, I have a couple of theories. There are a lot of things in my life where I know that I like it one way or another, but I'm not sure why, so I guess as to why. And then over time, like the older I get, the more set in my ways I am, the more I'm like, oh, I'm absolutely right about this thing that I just made up. <laughs> so um, there are a couple of things. When the drummer is sitting here, when you're like, your, your sense memory of what the drums sound like comes primarily from when you're sitting at the drums playing them, or if you're in the room with the drums hearing them play, right? That's what they sound like. And so when you're in the control room trying to trying to reanimate this sense memory of what it's like to hear the drums, um, I think the reason I prefer this kind of arrangement is that it's a little closer to the, to the, the, drum the, the experience yeah. of sitting in the room yeah. playing the drums, right? And that, I mean, that's, I think that, but I'm, I don't know. Um, for the for a very long time, I didn't use any overhead microphones. I just <coughs> used the stereo microphone in front of the drum kit. Yeah. Um, then I started using like there was a thing in the '90s where drummers were getting bigger and bigger drum kits with this shit everywhere, and you had to put spot mics around and pick up all the like all the number of jingle bells over here, crotales you know, over here, <laughs> crash stack over here. So you you ended up having to have spot mics <coughs> on things in order to pick up that stuff anyway, right? So then I gravitated towards using just a single stereo pair overhead rather than a bunch of individual spot mics. And uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, did a session at a private studio. And that private studio had a drum kit that they'd set up that was the, the drum, that's how they did the drums there. They had the drums in one spot and their setup for the drums was just a pair of Outrigger 4038s like that. And I was well, let's, I'll just open those up and see what it sounds like. It sounded great. And I was like, why am I fucking around with all these little microphones? Like, and then I realized, as is true with a lot of things, you can either use two big microphones or a bunch of little ones. You know, there's just that's the way it works. Um, so this is my method of like of synthesizing the uh, those two experiences, like using the close mics for clarity, but getting the the, the sort of you know, the sound from the driver's seat from these yeah. outrigger microphones. Um, and since I did that experiment of like listening to them, somebody else had obviously figured it out before me. <coughs> Everything that I do, like all of this stuff that I'm doing, like it's either stuff that I've like figured out through many, many iterations of failed experiments or something that somebody did for me and I just stole it. Right. right. So that's one of the things that I just stole from somebody else. They figured it out for me, so now I'm doing it. Kind of makes sense. It's, just, it's drummer's ear level, so it's yeah. natural yeah. for, for, us, for us drummers to hear the drum. Like I, I noticed when the when the mics are overhead, you, the symbols, like the swishing of the symbols into and away from the microphones, you get this weird like swashing, phasing effect. Right. Sometimes there's also like these sort of weird bongy, groaning overtones that you yeah. get sometimes. 
And I feel like I have much less of that when the symbols, when the, when the symbols are being sort of looked at from the sides. Yeah. I'm not. I, I don't know the physics of it, and I don't want to guess, but I, I feel like it's just less work for me to get a nice, satisfying, like bright, sustaining sound if I have a mic set up this way. Do you measure microphones ever? No. Oh. There's a there's a kind of a gimmick that took off on the internet where people are trying to phase align all the mics on their yeah. drum kit to the snare drum, which is just on its face just seems insane to me. Like. Um, because if you align all of these microphone time align all these microphones to the snare drum, then you've just made them worse with everything else in the drum kit. You know, yeah. it's as though the snare drum was literally the only mic the only sound that you cared about. You know, that just seems crazy to me. Um, although I guess the, that is that might be somebody's approach toward trying to solve the problem that I would have would have with the overheads, where the snare drum sound and the overheads was kind of crappy. Mm -hmm. So I, my solution to that is to attenuate the crappy sound rather than to try to accommodate the crappy sound by making everything else line up with the crappy sound, you know that might that you know that doesn't mean that it doesn't satisfy some like if if you do it that way that it doesn't sound good. It might sound good, but um, I don't. I've never. I as an analog engineer, I don't get into the micro adjustment of individual tracks, and things tend to be recorded and they stay the way they've been recorded. Um, I meant more like um, physically measured. Like, yeah, like literally just like, taking it. Yeah, step by step. I've never, I've never done it. Okay. Uh, just because the physical layout of each drum kit is different. Yeah. And the same deal. Like if okay, this microphone is fairly close to the snare drum. This microphone's a little farther away, right? But I can in, in, envision a drum kit setup where that it would be the other way around, even. You know. Um, so I've never concerned myself with that sort of standardization. I've always just. I, uh, whatever the drum kit is that walks through the front door, I try to deal with it as it is. Yeah. Have you ever tried the technique that you use for the front batter side of the kit drum on the overheads rather than using the limiter? So using oh, the so it's side chaining the. Yeah. yeah. So you're taking the I side chain from no. the side. No. That's what I thought you were talking about. Yeah, no, I, ha I haven't. Yeah. It's still there. <laughs> Starting to think, I'm trying to trying to think why I thought that would be why I wouldn't have done that. It seems like it, it's seems like it might work. work. <laughs> it would be faster. But then again, you have to sleep. Yeah, I might. I might. Who knows? Um, talk to me in a year and see what I can do. <laughs> Maybe I've just stolen that from you. Um, okay, so one other thing that I want to mention. I did one of these little teaching seminars at, at a studio in France, and a dude from Canada had said that um, came up with a thing where he saw the way that I was doing the toms, where you had a top mic and a bottom mic, and um, let's see if I can demonstrate with another microphone here. You got it. Well, okay, so. And he said, and he said he came up with an idea to do something similar, which was to use a figure eight microphone, like this microphone or a ribbon microphone, where it had a top lobe and a bottom lobe. And he would put the figure eight microphone right up next to the shell of the drum. So the top lobe was hearing the top head of the drum, and the bottom lobe was, lobe was hearing the bottom head of the drum. And they were summing inside the single microphone. So doing the same thing as having two microphones, but summed through the console, but one microphone doing all of that inside of itself. And um, he, suggest, he said that he did that, and he liked the way it sounded. And I started thinking about it, and I was like, well, you know, that might work. And so and uh, so I tried it using the 4038s and using the Bayer M130s and a couple other microphones. I tried it. And my when I first put it up on the on the toms, and I opened the fader, I was like, wow, this really does work. This this crazy thing. It's actually it's doing, it's much easier than the thing that I've been doing, right? Um, and when the drummer was just playing the toms, it sounded really, really good. And then he started playing the whole drum kit, and I realized that that microphone was also just listening to the underside of the cymbal, and it was just an unusable amount of bleed. But if I was ever in a scenario where I didn't have any cymbals to deal with, I think I might try that as well, because it, it was an interesting thing. It was 
significantly simpler than doing this, but it was the same basic idea. It was like you're hearing the top head and the bottom head simultaneously. Um, so if you don't have two microphones, but you're, you don't have a bunch of cymbals to deal with, you might be able to get away with just using a single figure eight microphone on the side of the drum for the same, using in the same convention. What do you get more of by having a bottom head on the tones? Is it I can dense, demonstrate or? it for you, oh, okay. but basically the when you hear the drum played, um, you're hearing the, you hear the initial attack sound, but then you hear the sort of full sustaining sound of the drum, and then it dies away. Okay. When I'm listening to just the top mic, I feel like the attack component is exaggerated, and the sustaining sound is not well represented, and I feel like the drum tends to die away quickly. Um, but I'll I'll show you. I can demonstrate when you when we get in. I'll have Barry do a quick sound check, and I'll show you one mic and then both mics. Um, and there's a very easy way to set a balance between them. If you turn the top mic on and get a level to tape that's a little bit lower than you would normally have, and then you open the bottom mic and gradually bring the level up on it, you'll get to a point where it cancel where you hear maximum cancellation, where you have the acoustic energy is about equal between the two, and it'll cause a null. Um, and then if you made the bottom mic louder, higher, it would get louder. If you made it, made it, made it lower, it would get louder as well. But when you get to the point where it's at a null, that's where you have the, the most overlap of those two microphones. And then if you reverse the polarity there, then you get the maximum sustain and the maximum body. Now, you might not want to leave it there. That might be, might be too fat, for example. It might have too much sustain, and you might want to trim it down from there. But that's a good sort of starting point, is to find the point where the two are sort of canceling each other out and then reverse the polarity on them. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so the last thing that I was going to tell you about was the mic mics on the floor, the ambient mics. And the reason that they're on the floor uh, is to minimize the re early reflections off of the floor. And uh, I'll do a diagram on the whiteboard when we can follow up to explain about that. Um, but if you Google the boundary effect and microphones, you'll find that it's a very old principle. It goes back to the very dawn of of the electrical recording era. Um, like the, the earliest recording era was acoustic recording, where they would use an acoustic horn to make a wax cylinder or a wax disc. Uh, and then they, would, they grad, graduated from there, actually the vacuum tube was invented, to doing electrical recording, where the, an amplified microphone would be used to make a wax disc or the wax cylinder. And from that very beginning, um, people started experimenting with acoustics and they learned about the boundary effect. And so it's a very, very old principle that I'm taking advantage of, but I'll do a little diagram and explain in the control room. Um, the, the only thing I want to point out about the, the microphones on the floor is that they're not precisely symmetrical with the drum kit, but that's mainly to do with the slight eccentricity in the room. But I do try to keep them sort of equidistant from the middle of the drum kit. Like I, I don't like to have one that's dead in front of the drum kit and one that's way off to the side, because then the balance of the of the instruments in the, those mics tends to be too different. Like the one that's dead in front gets a lot of the bass drum, the one that's off to the side gets a lot of the hi hat and the snare drum. And so the balance between the two like starts to sound odd to me. So I try to have the two microphones kind of each picking up a roughly similar. Uh, spectrum of the drum kit. So that's why they're sort of equidistant from either side of the, of the center line of the drum kit. Do you treat these kind of like <clears throat> a room ambient, like, a, like an effect rather yes. than? Yes. <clears throat> they're not a principal sound, they're not a principal component of the sound. They're more of, a, of an ambient effect. And it'll vary quite a bit from song to song, like how much of it you want to hear. Um, songs that are like, have a lot of open space and where you can hear like the sustaining sound of the drums and there's a lot of room between beats where you can hear the decay of the room and stuff, it's nice and voluptuous to have the ambient sound sort of booming along. But then like faster, more energetic stuff, it gets quite blurry and messy if you have a lot of ambient sound. So for a room like this, would you would you be perfectly happy with that or would you add other synthesizers? I tend not to use artificial reverb. I, it does happen once in a, in a while. Um, yeah, we won't get to mixing anything today, but in the mixing stage, it's occasionally the case that there's a there's a psychoacoustic principle where you're we 
your your brain has evolved the ability to perceive space through acoustic cues. Like when you hear a reverberant sound, your brain forms an image of a size acoustic space. Like you can, it, you know, you can tell if you're in a small room or a large room from the acoustic cues that go on the room, right? Uh, your brain is only able to resolve one such space at a time. So if you are hearing multiple reverberant cues, if you're hearing multiple kinds of echo and reverb and ambience, your brain picks one as the dominant sound, and you perceive that as an ambient sound, and it, and it forms the sound, the size of the room that your, that your brain uh, resolves for you and, and sets the acoustic space. <clears throat> and the other ambient sounds are no longer perceived as ambience, but they're perceived as some kind of a sustaining sound or a tone or an, uh, a fundamental sound rather than an ambient sound. You may have noticed this effect, like you'll be listening to the, the drum kit, and the drum kit will have a nice like natural ambience on it, and then the guitar player plays his Fender Twin with a wet reverb on it, and now the drum sounds dry and small. Or the vocalist has a big, long, sustained reverb on it, and suddenly the you know, the whole rest of the band sounds like it's very, like, sort of muddy and indistinct, and you don't hear the ambient cues. And that's because your brain cannot simultaneously resolve a large space and a small space because it is not part of the sense experience uh, of, of the millennia that it has taken us to evolve this ability. It's a subconscious thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, no human being has ever simultaneously been in a large room and a small room. So. Our brains, we have not resolved, we have not evolved the ability to, to differentiate between a large room and a small room simultaneously. What happens is that in one moment, your brain says, oh, we're in a big room. And then when that ambient cue disappe disappears, if there's another ambient cue, your brain then says, ah, now we're in a small room. Oh, now we're in a big room. Now we're in a small room. You can't, your brain can't resolve them all simultaneously, which is why when you have competing ambient cues, like a, a long vocal reverb or a e vocal echo or a guitar reverb or something like that, then the ambient sound of the drums or any other instrument tends to disappear. If you have two guitars, both of them playing with a reverberant or echoey sound, you're, you tend only to be aware of the echo or the ambience on one of them. The other one, it might hear, you might hear that the guitar is sustaining more, or you might hear that the sound is longer, or that it takes a while for it to disappear, but you won't perceive it as space or as ambience. Um, I mean, that's that, that there is a, a lot of time and energy spent in the studio trying to make reverbs and echoes uh, avoid competing with each other. And um, I, I've learned over the years that it's kind of a futile effort, but generally speaking, if, if something sounds ambient, it's because it's in a, an uncluttered listening environment where there aren't other ambient cues confusing it. And if something sounds ambient and you overwhelm it with another kind of ambience from something else, then the original ambient cues change and they're no longer ambient cues. You no longer perceive space or size, you, you perceive a change in sound quality. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a, principle called the Haas effect, okay. which is where, um, like I'm speaking in this room and I can hear my voice reflecting off of those walls. I'm about, say, 15, 18 feet from that wall. So when I say something, my voice goes out and hits that wall, it takes maybe 15, 18 milliseconds to get to that wall, hits that wall, turns around, comes back at me. So I'm hearing a perceived round trip delay of about 30 milliseconds. And as it turns out, about 30 milliseconds is about the boundary of the Haas effect, where you can start to perceive reverberant effects. Anything less than that, less than about 30 milliseconds, and you're within the Haas boundary, uh, the, within the Haas effect, where you, no, you don't hear these ambient cues as reflections, you hear them as filtering effects, or as tonal effects, or as okay an artifact of the sustain of the sound, but your brain doesn't resolve them as ambient cues because they are within this Haas limitation, right? Okay. Um, that's one of the reasons why in a very small room, 
even when you have the ambient microphones as far away as you can get them, when you add that ambient effect to the drums, you might get a change in the sound quality or a change in the perceived stereo image, but you don't hear an ambient effect because the amount of time that it takes the microphone, the sound to get to the microphone is not a long enough period of time for your, for your brain to resolve that as an ambient cue. Right? There's a gimmick around that, which I will I'll explain when we get into the controller and I'll show you the thing. Like these microphones on the floor here, they're only 12 or 15 feet away from the drum kit. And when I open those up as ambient microphones, the perceived distance is short enough that those, mic those cues would still be within the host limit, right? So I add a few milliseconds of delay to them as it indicated on the track sheet. And that moves that those reflected sounds or that ambient sound the outside of the host limit so you can hear it as an That's ambient crazy. Effect. Yeah. <clears throat> There's also, it bothers me that I feel the need to explain myself so thoroughly. <laughs> it's the pedantic nature that makes my wife furious with me when someone just says something like, what kind of cookies are these? And then I go for like 20 minutes, right? But I feel obliged, since this is kind of a, this is a technical environment, like you guys uh, could make use of this information, I feel obliged to be thorough. Okay, so, good. So, good. So, I'm sitting at the drum kit here. If I play the drums, we have the same sort of round trip effect of the acoustic sound. The acoustic sound leaves the drums, goes and hits the walls, turn, turns around, comes back at me. I hear it at a perceived reflected, my the ref, initial reflections that I hear from distant walls are about 25, 30 milliseconds from away. So when I'm playing the drums here, I can hear an ambient effect in, of this room, right? If I put those microphones as far away as they can be from drums, and I listen to the effect in the control room, <clears throat> the effect is not the same. I don't hear the same perceived ambient effect. If I add a small amount of additional delay to those ambient microphones, I then mimic the effect of that round trip echo time. Because the extra time it takes to turn back to you to use it. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, when that dawned on me, <clears throat> that this I, I started doing the, the gimmick with delaying the room mics because somebody else told me that he did it and it worked. <laughs> and so I started trying it and I was like, hey, this sounds great. Why did I, you know, what's the deal with this? And so then I was experimenting with different delay times and, and, uh, and for the longest time, I couldn't figure out, I didn't have any notion about why it sounded better, you know? Like, even in a room, let's say I was in a room that where I could put the mics 50 feet away. I put the mics 50 feet away, and I listened to them in the control room, and it still didn't sound as big as it did when I was sitting in the, in, in the drummer's seat, right? And then it, I add a small amount of additional delay, and it sounded, and suddenly it sort of reanimated re that sound. Like, oh yeah, that's what it sounds like. And I, it, when it dawned on me that what it was what I was doing was I was adding the additional delay time that you hear acoustically in the room, um, I, I felt like a veil had been lifted on my comprehension of what I was doing. I was doing it anyway, mm -hmm. right? And it's not like I thought it, I figured it out in, in some sort of genius mode. I was doing it anyway because I stole it from somebody else. And but I think I think I realized I think I realized now why I prefer it. And it's a gimmick that I use on all kinds of stuff. I use it on vocal ambient microphones, like when the vocalist is singing in a big room. Um, I use it on orchestral recordings when I'm like, recording a string section or whatever, like the ambient microphones in the, in the hall. I'll delay those slightly and it'll give you that sort of perceived doubling effect. Um, do, you I, say, do you send it for tracking to make someone more comfortable with headphones on? If they're more comfortable? No. no. If, if. Although. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, no. Oh, uh, well, I should say, for vocalists, when the vocalist is singing, if I'm using an ambient microphone for the vocalist, I'll always open it in their headphones and ask them if they prefer it with it in or with it out. And if they prefer it with it out, I take it out. If they prefer it with it in, I leave it in. Um, but in a scenario like this, I wouldn't normally do it just because it's hard enough to get a headphone mix that you can, where you can hear everything. I don't want to complicate it. Okay. So. I have a question about the kick drum. Yeah. Effect. Because whenever I try to do this, I think I read this in a tape up at some point <laughs> years ago. 
And uh, whenever I try and do something to delay the, the room might, it might be because they are already relatively far away in our room or something. But I'm really struggling with uh, with the low end, really starting to struggle no matter if I use 20 milliseconds, 25, 30 or something like it. And I always get this, um, which sounds great on the snail, a slight slap, slap, but yeah. uh, I get the same with the kick drum, and that usually mushes up the low end quite, quite drastically. Uh, I know the effect that you're talking about. Maybe I've gotten used to it, and maybe I've got grown fond of it, but uh, it doesn't doesn't disturb me. Yeah, and I also tend on the ambient microphones. I tend to use microphones with very good low frequency response, and I tend to worry less about the high frequency response, like the the cymbals and the snare drum and that sort of stuff. I tend to um, get most of that information from the closer microphones. And the distant microphones tend to pick up more of the rumble of the drum kit, like the sustaining tom sound, the fatness of the snare drum, things like that. Um, yeah, so I'm aware of the thing that you're describing, I, but it, it just doesn't bother me. I never really hear it in anything you do. That's the funny thing. It's kind of like, it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I get the medium dollars. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I, no, I totally yeah. understand. And, uh, in a situation where the bass drum is not very resonant, that is where it has either no front head or a big hole in the front head, and it's very, or a hard wooden beater, that sort of thing, where there's a very strong attack on the bass drum, um, I tend to notice that fluttering effect more, and in those cases, I probably use less of the ambience mm. because it would, uh, because it's a nuisance. Yeah. yeah. So, a long time ago, somebody asked about artificial reverb. Who was that? Yeah. So, a long time ago, <laughs> three stories ago, um, uh, you asked if I was using artificial ambience. One of the things that I do is, in uh, if a uh, if something if a vocal or an instrument is recorded in it dry, and it seems uh, like it's superimposed on the rest of the music, like if there's a guitar solo or a vocal passage or something like that and it seems like it's separating in an uncomfortable way, I will sometimes use a single dull slap echo, which, uh, and I'll fiddle with the time of it until it sounds like it's in keeping with the rest of the ambient cues in the, in the band, rather than distinguishing it from the rest of the band. The, the idea is I'm trying to make it sound like it's a of a type with the rest of the band. Gluing it together. So um, I, I, I do use... I use it like a single slap or a, a, something like that. I use that much more often than I would use like a sustaining reverb. The the exception to that would be like there are some styles of music where there is characteristically like a, a very wet vocal sound. For example, like I do a lot of records with it. There's a country singer named Robbie Fultz from Chicago. I've done a dozen records with him. And every, every so often he'll want to be mimicking or evoking a certain era of country music where like a, a really wet plate reverb on the vocal is like a very prominent effect on the vocal. And so uh, like he's very fond of that. And I, I use a plate reverb on his vocal a lot. Um, there's a, there are a number of situations where um, at a certain point in a song, you'll be trying to evoke some kind of a a special moment, and one of the ways to do that is to differentiate that moment by creating an, an obvious stylized sound. And in those bits, anything goes. Like okay. You could have like a runaway echo or a, a big reverb or something like that. But as a sort of normal matter of course, I don't often use reverb in things. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to explain a little bit further. There's a thing about artificial reverb which makes it very difficult for the artificial reverb to be perceived as naturalistic. And that is that because of the way reverb is generated, that is, a close mic signal is sent to an algorithm at a point source, and then that algorithm, or that if it's a mechanical plate or a spring or something like that, that individual single point is then irradiated out to the boundaries of the system and then comes back in reflection. Yeah. And then if you were to send multiple things, they would all be coming from that initial point where they're infused into the system, whether it's an algorithm 
or whether it's a driver on a plate or a driver on a spring, all of the sound enters the system at this one spot, right? In an acoustic environment, all of these drums, for example, are different physical distances from all of the walls, and so they are radiating in different directions at different intensities and different frequency responses from the different physical angles of attack of the different instruments. And it's a three-dimensional space, so the sound folds back on itself in many ways. So artificial reverb, even the best convolution reverbs that are using gunshot samples and things like that, they can be better than simple mathematical algorithms at creating a naturalistic space. They can never mimic the three-dimensional effect of something in a room, like a, even if it's something like a piano. Right? A piano is seven feet long and five feet wide, and it's, the shit is radiating in all directions from it. If you play piano through a reverb, it's not going to sound the same as if you record the piano in a hall. And the reason that it isn't is because you have this three-dimensional radiating effect from the sound source as opposed to a point source effect from uh, an algorithmic reverb or an mechan electromechanical reverb. Um, there have been some attempts over the years to synthesize this naturalistic space <coughs> by playing signals back out into a room and recording the room. Even that, if you think about it, the sound is coming out of a single speaker in the middle of the room, even that is exciting the room from a point source. So the fact that it is a natural three-dimensional space, again, it may make some accommodations for this artificial quality, but you still have that same limitation on it. Is that something you can really, you'd really be able to hear? And for the longest time, I hated reverb. Because of everything. And I don't, I, I don't know that this is why, mm -hmm. but I do know that I prefer the natural sound, ambient sounds, natural ambient sounds, to synthetic reverb sounds. Mm -hmm. In almost all cases, unless we're going, unless I'm going for something, unless I've been asked to make some sort of fantastic sound, where you want a stylized sound, like, and that comes up pretty often, like once in a while, you know, like often enough, you know. People will say, well, I want this part to sound like we're in space. Or, you know, this part, you know, I want this should be really wet and really lush and really deep and really, you know, like, then, you know, the sky's the limit there. But just as a natural, like, a, as a sort of run-of-the-mill, meat and potatoes kind of thing, I tend to prefer natural ambient sounds to synthetic ones. And, uh, yeah, um, that's probably, that, that, that might be why. But I... I, I tend to indulge my preferences without questioning them. Um, one of the smartest things I ever read in any form of criticism, there was a film critic named Roger Ebert. He's dead now, but he wrote an essay about film criticism. He was an early champion of um, like really obscure art films that had an obtuse and difficult to understand premise. And he was also a champion of things like Russ Meyer, like big titty romps and things like that. And he loved like screwball comedies and he liked, he liked many genres of film and he sort of equated them all as an artistic spectrum. And this essay that he wrote about why he was willing to take seriously all this kind of trashy stuff as well as all of this high art, he said that, that um, he had learned never to question a belly laugh and never question a hard on. <laughs> so, uh, if you are turned on by something, there's really no argument. There's really no point in discussing it. That that's what you're into. You know? <laughs> or if something makes you laugh, you know, okay, you could be embarrassed that you laughed at it, but you thought it was funny. You know? <laughs> and you can tell because you were laughing. And so, and I tend to tend to treat all of my preferences that way. Like if I if I'm listening to something and I like it, I don't I don't yeah, it doesn't it doesn't bother me that I like something that for a reason that I can't comprehend. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. My wife has a sort of a similar shorthand. She says there are no guilty pleasures. Okay. They are all pleasure. Okay. And if you feel guilty about it, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I should go in. We should go into the control room so I can stop talking for a minute, and I'll draw a diagram about the boundary effect, and then I'll draw another diagram about the Haas effect thing, and then we'll have the band run through a sound check. Maybe take a break. You can even get them to drink. <laughs> <laughs>
just being like fighting for Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, can you get a something I can wipe all this off sure. with? Yeah. Other, oh, um, but use my hat. Oh, <laughs> sure. How many people are there? Is there where the air is? Uh, I'm still not waiting. It's still the seat I got. All right. Can they ask to pick it up? The two cold smiths yeah. next door, do you balance them like how you would balance the ambient mics? As in, say, the left the drummers, and right like, oh, yeah. So the one on the left, in my imagination, will have a lot more snare and hi hat yeah. than anything else in I don't, the other one. I don't worry about it too much. I'm it's trying to get the, the electrical levels reasonably close, but the main thing is that when I listen to them as a stereo image, it should sound sort of like I expect it to. Like when he's playing a hi hat, oh, I should feel it pulling to the left. When he plays the floor tom, I should feel it pulling to the right. When he plays the right cymbal, I feel it pulling to the right. Um, drummer's perspective. Drummer's perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, that's the key yeah I, I started doing that from the very beginning, and I don't know why. Um, I think it was just like that sense memory thing. Like oh, it, seemed, right. it just seemed seemed wrong if I did it. Yeah. Yeah. I, think I, it's a, I think it's a musician thing. If you come in a, as a musician, you always expect to be said the thing. I think so. I, I mean, I, I'll uh, I, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is that, like, I've noticed. I feel that way about everything. Like, I don't play the piano, right? But if I sat at the piano and I bonged on the bass side, it would be on the left. Yeah. So if I'm listening to a piano recording and somebody's bonging on the bass side of the piano and it's on the right, it fucking pisses me off. Okay. Yeah. You know? yes. But I don't know, you know, that there's a thing, there's a, a, a principle that comes into play a lot with me is like, if I hear something and I don't get it or I think it's wrong, and then I have a conversation with the band, and they explain themselves, and then suddenly I realize that they're that it's right. I refer to that as listener error, right? And so this thing that I have about well, my prejudices about what things I like, like I like I prefer drummer's perspective in stereo, and I prefer the bass on the left if I'm listening to piano recording, right? That might very well be a case of me indulging in listener error, uh, you know, like somebody else might have chosen the opposite perspective for a perfectly rational reason. Like, no, I want to simulate the concert experience, and you're you're not at the drums, you're in front of the drums, asshole. Like, <laughs> I can totally, and I buy that. I think that's totally totally reasonable. But I, like I said, I tend to indulge my preferences unquestioningly. So, I've had, I've had a few because I do a lot of video recording for concerts as well. I've had a few, I've had a few panics where. I've mixed the audio for a band because they wanted the audio and then they've got the video later and put the audio to the video mm. and it's things the like drummers perfect I'm, I'm all messed up 
Yeah. Uh, so um, sorry to cut you off. Is there a CD player in here? No. No. There's one in the back if you play in. Yeah. I just did a. I was just in LA for um, a couple of days. I recorded three nights of Ty Siegel at, a, at this ballroom with a live for a live album. We had a mobile truck with a multi-track in it and the whole shebang. So I recorded like six hours of his, his concerts of uh, three nights. And Dave? Uh, what's that? Dave. Yeah. Um, it was the old record plant mobile truck and we rented the tape machine and strapped it in. It was, uh, it was, it was fun as hell. So <laughs> I, I've done a half a dozen live records and I really enjoy them. They're super high stress, but I really That would be so sketch. That's the formula is usually okay, isn't it? It's, it's all about trying to get a band comfortable in the studio can be a hard thing. So when you put them in bands play they so to? much better when they're yeah, just in their normal environment, you know, like yeah. they're just, you know, when there's, you know, they're not worried about anything. They're just blowing. It's yeah. really, really good. And and also there's just something about like knowing that they're gonna, pre that, you know, I'm I'm never gonna interrupt them. Like yeah. I'm, I'm never gonna blow it for them. Like make them stop at, at something that they're in the middle of, you know, because we've yeah. got an audience. Like there's they're something about gonna, that. They're not gonna stop if you fluff a vocal. It's just gonna yeah. keep on going. You're not gonna. <clears throat> anyway, I was, but the, that live recording, I just did a bunch of rough mixes for him so he could choose takes of, from the, the, like oh, yeah. 70 songs to choose from or whatever. Okay. But I've got, I have one of the CDs with me and that's from the stage perspective. So like, okay. Ty's guitar is on the far left and Emmett's guitar is on the far right and the saxophone and the bass player are in the middle and the keyboard, you know, the piano player is in the middle and the drum kit's in the middle and the back. And like the whole thing is from stage perspective. That's, really that's cool. interesting. Yeah. And the vocals as well. Like, the, well, and the reason we had to do it that way is there was a, the um, stage microphones, like the sta the audience perspective stereo, yeah. or, or the the stereo that was picked up in the hall, is pretty discreet. Like you can hear that Ty's guitar is on one side and Emmett's guitar is on the other side. So you have to observe that stereo one way or the other. Yeah. Um, but we just decided to do it all from stage perspective, and it sound I think it sounds really cool. But it but it, like if you bring up the ambience from the back of the room. You can still hear that Ty's guitar is on one side and Emmett's guitar is on the other yeah. side. So it like, sort of made sense. Should that it. make any difference to the feeling that you are in the band rather than just the fact that you've planned? Can that make a difference to the I fact that you feel that you're on stage? I mean, I've been in bands watching? my whole life, so it yeah. seems normal to me. But yeah. if, I'd, you know, you know, if I'd never been in a band, maybe I wouldn't even know which side the hi hat is on. Like, I, how would I know? Yeah. You know? Would I care? I don't know. So I feel like. Yeah, the other thing is that I also feel like making a record should be like a, a supremely selfish enterprise. For the <laughs> like I feel like they should just be suiting themselves 100% of the time. Well, yeah, so, see, most of the time bands come in here and they say, right, we're, we're, we're kind of rehearsed. And we think the BPM's around about this, could we give them a click? And I say, well, do you rehearse with a click? Do yeah, you yeah. play live with a click? And they say, no. I say, well, that's really the last thing you should be doing. Yeah. The first step in the studio is like, let's put a click on this. And, why do you want to sequence something? No. Well, There's a, why, why it's not? a defensive posture. People are concerned that they will be perceived as being unprofessional yeah. or bad if they're kind of. Yeah, but then you get that fluctuation of the drummer trying to move from in and out of time with a click. My friend Jay <laughs> Tiller ha has the best description of playing to a metronome. He says it's like driving with a cop behind you. <laughs> 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 and and uh, like there are some yeah. bands that like, especially bands that like have looping and stuff in the band. Like where they play to a metronome or they have a drum machine as part of the band, you're like, that sort of stuff where it's totally normal for them. Yeah. And that's fine, right? But if a band doesn't use a click or a metronome as like an inter integral part of the band, adding one at the last minute is really disruptive and really, really useful. And the other thing is, seriously, who the fuck cares? Like, has no one has ever brought a record back to the store and said, you know, I. <laughs> I would have liked this, but they sped up in the bridge. And, yeah. you know, like, I just I, think, I can't have this in my house. Yeah. I'm, I'm professional. Like I and I I just don't think people listen to music that way. I don't think I've never. It's never occurred to me when I was listening to a record. Like never, not once in my life has I have I ever thought, oh, they sped up a little bit there. Like it's just never yeah. crossed my mind. It usually does in a natural way. So you speed up into the chorus. Yeah. So that's that's fine. Just you hear a click that. though. What's that? So you hear a click back into the metronome sometimes. Like you. Yeah. Like yeah. you can tell, like if it's an awful record, yeah, you can tell like, that there's a metronome going all the way through. Like, yeah. Every Huey Lewis record is going to have a, 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 a metronome for sure. <laughs> Loverboy, for sure, metronome. Yeah, Def Leppard, hundred yeah, percent. Absolutely. Yeah. What percentage of the clients do you 
Jesus would be awful, or oh, no, no, no. <laughs> if he's a he's a temple. Is it is it like a fan preference? It's absolutely fan preference. Um, I I'm it's got to be under ten percent. Okay. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. How much stuff is the crazy? <laughs> I mean, it, we're in, America is different from England. Like, there's much more of like a performance culture in America, and there's much more of like an industry culture over here. Like, we've been more like this is how it's done in the business for over here versus all my friends are in bands and they do it this way. You know, like that's yeah. you know, so. okay. So I'm going to do a little. Di this diagram is the beginning of me explaining about the boundary effect. Okay, so. Um, this is a, let's say this is a snare drum, and this is a microphone at a distance. Um, the shortest, the first arrival of the sound on this microphone is this path right there. The straight line path of this microphone hearing that sound at a distance, right? The next shortest path, like the thing that it hears next quickest, is this reflected path off the floor, right? And the next quickest thing that it hears is this reflected path sort of billiarding out of the corner off of the floor. And the next one that it hears after that is this one here, right? So it's hearing all of these reflect, and this is for one, one plane, but bear in mind it's three-dimensional space, so it's hearing the same reflections off of the side walls and, as well as front and back walls, right? So, and then the the ad additional reflections are much longer paths, like this. And all of those are going to take a lot longer to get to that microphone, and they're going to be a lot lower in level relative to these near early reflections, right? So if we take this microphone and move it to the floor right here, then you still get this initial onset of the sound, like the sound of the mic picking up the drum at a distance. But any of these early reflections that incorporate the floor, any of these other ones, which would otherwise be the most dominant reflections in that microphone, all of those reflected paths miss that microphone. So the microphone can't hear them, right? So the only reflected energy, that is the only reverberant cues that this microphone hears, are all of these long paths that come from the ceiling and from all over the other dimensions in the room, right? So this microphone is not hearing any of these early reflections, and those early reflections will have very short delay times of, you know, five to 10 milliseconds, things like that. And all of those early reflections clustering together at relatively high level tend to muddy up the arrival time of this initial sound. So you get a lot of competing inter information, and then the much quieter ambient stuff that comes from farther away is much more difficult to hear. At, with the boundary effect, you get a very clean pickup of the sound at a distance because of these early reflections are all missing the microphone. But then the only reverberant sound you hear is the much more distant stuff, much more diffused stuff. So the reverberant sound in the microphone on the floor is going to be more distant and more diffuse. And the immediate pickup from the, <clears throat> the initial straight line path to the sound is going to be a lot cleaner because it won't have all of these overlapping early reflections. So that's the reason I put the microphones on the floor. I don't, it also it's slightly easier because I don't have to have a stand for them and all that sort of stuff. Um, but this principle works whether it's on the wall or on a floor. But if it's on the wall, uh, generally speaking, the stuff is closer to the floor than it is to the wall. So you're going to be still be getting reflections off of the floor. And so you will get early reflections off of the floor that you won't get if you put the microphone on the floor. That's what that's about. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna, about to erase this unless somebody is in the middle of copying it down. Right? Okay. So I'm going to show you one more thing about the, <clears throat> the Haas effect or the Haas boundary, I'm going to draw a little graphic diagram, a graphic representation of the sound. And let's say this sound is a drum or somebody shouting or something like that. Like, it's, let's say it's a drum. You're going to have an, an attack, <coughs> a very sharp rise time, and then you're going to have a sort of sustaining sound that's going to peter out to nothing. 
Um, all right. Now, the, let's say you have a, a reverber, a, an ambient microphone, a microphone out in the room. <clears throat> and that ambient microphone is going to have a relatively, there's going to be a little bit of a delay before its arrival. So it's going to arrive, that, that'll overlap slightly here. So it'll come in later. You won't have quite as sharp of an attack. And then the sustaining sound will sustain out a little bit longer because of the reverberant effect of the room. All of this information here, that is the body of the sound that you've recorded, is going to be masked or, or muddied by the overlapping effect of the ambient sound overlapping the initial onset of the sound. <clears throat> if you take this sound and move it out of the Haas region so that you can then perceive it as a separate sound, that is a separate reflected sound. Let's say you have it here. You have two effects. The first effect is that you hear the initial onset of the sound speaking much more clearly. You have a much smaller region of that sound that's being masked, right, and at a much lower level. And the total decay time of the room will Im increase by the amount of the ambient delay that you've added. So you get a perceived longer decay time, you get a clearer initial onset of the sound, and because the sounds are not overlapping as much, you can more clearly hear the reverberant reflection as a reflected sound. Right? So that's like a graphical representation of the sound moving out of the Haas region where you can't perceive it as a, as a reflected sound into the region where you can hear it as a reflected sound. And what, sorry, what would that be in milliseconds, the Haas? Roughly, it's different per person. Like it's, right, okay. it's, when it was first, when the experiments were done by Haas to figure out <laughs> how, how far away from a wall you had to be before you could hear an echo, okay. he would have people move physical distances away from the wall, and then he would clap or say something and make a, make a sound, and he, they would tell him when they could perceive the echo, okay. right? And he did that with a lot of different people, and it works out to about 30 milliseconds. It, on average, it's about 30 milliseconds. So, um, yeah. Now, you can hear, if you hear very sharp transient sounds, you can hear a difference between those two sharp transient sounds, like, like stick clicks or something like that. You can hear very brittle percussive sounds. Yeah. You can hear a difference between the initial sound and the reflected sound um, down to about 10 milliseconds. Okay. But, and this is the, the bit that Haas was getting at, is you hear that as two sounds, but you don't hear it. Your brain doesn't resolve it as a reflected ambient sound. Your brain resolves it as two, two, sounds, two sounds, but not as an ambient cue. And that goes back to that whole psychoacoustic thing that we were talking about, yeah. about how we've, we've, over millennia, evolved yeah. the ability to perceive space. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Can I erase this? All right, so now I'm gonna, we should do a little sound check and I should demonstrate some of this stuff. <laughs> so almost all of these things that I'm demonstrating are all, I'm, I'm doing them in the an, an, analog domain because that's how I learned how to do them and that's um, how I think of things. A lot of this stuff you could do inside the box in a digital sense. There are certain things that I that you can't do digitally um, in it, that I can. Well, I don't know if we're going to get into any of them. Probably, yeah, yeah, probably not. I didn't want to mix them all. Yeah. There's one one gimmick in particular where you make a resonant equalizer, which you can't do in the digital domain because it involves going out of the desk and back into the desk and that latency we uh, screw up. Screw in there. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, let's get the fans in. Let's see where they are. That's a debate. It's about, and unless you guys want to go. Oh, you go for it. That's why I actually sat down there and offered them so that you could, so I could put that middle seat.
Do you have um, do you use Airport in your studio, Michael? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, been tracking them all day. Yeah. I'm uh, bringing the books. Yeah. It's a total financial decision that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These days, like even even rooting, I think I get lost. But but you wouldn't. But in Pro Tools, like it makes so much sense in my head, like <laughs> all the channels and everything everywhere. But I'm sure you'd be fine. Oh, maybe. I, I just I, I just don't think I'm so isolated where I am. It's like I, I just have no opportunity to talk to anybody else. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> even even sitting here's blowing my mind. <laughs> you came down for this, eh? yeah? Yeah. So, I'm going to, when Barry's in there, I'm going to talk to him for a minute, and then I'll have him demonstrate. We'll, I'll go through every mic on the list, and you'll see what I'm getting at with all this stuff. Okay, if you would just play slow quarter notes on the bass drum for me for a bit. So this is the microphone that's in front of the bass drum. And you can see it's moving the meter on the 1176 couple dB. He's not twatting it really hard here. Um, in the heat of battle, he'll be hitting it harder and it'll move another couple of dB from there. But um, relatively slow attack on the 1176, relatively slow release. A um, couple reasons for that. The slow attack allows the initial percussive attack of the bass drum to come through before the compressor kicks in. The slow re release prevents the sort of boinging, sproinging overtones of the bass drum from overwhelming the sort of long sustaining tone. The slow release tends to exaggerate the longer sustaining tone and minimize the sort of quick boinging, sproinging overtones. Um, This is that microphone that's on the batter side. Um, I don't have the expander in right now, and I'm going to demonstrate the what happens when he hits the snare drum. Hey, Barry, can you hit your snare drum for me a few times? So that's the splattery sound of the snare drum in that microphone. And if I turn this gate on, and, but uh, so this is the ducker that's operating, we, it, the insert is not inserted right now, but you can see that the ducker is attenuating that microphone every time he hits the snare drum. And if I turn this insert on, you'll hear the effect of that. So oh. now, okay, can you alternate bass drum and snare drum for me, please? So this is that batter side microphone with the expander with the ducker gate combination. So that's the batter side microphone. That's the front side microphone. And that's the combination of them. So I'll pull the batter side microphone out and now I'll put it back in. doesn't really change the overall character of the bass drum, it just gives it more definition and more edge. Okay, um, just a moment. So one other thing I wanted to demonstrate. Oh, the polarity. Yeah. Okay, can I hear just bass drum again? So just slow quarter notes is fine. So this is, sorry. Um, this is without a 
and changing the polarity of either microphone. And now I'm going to flip the polarity of the batter side microphone. Slightly deeper, not a huge change, and that's because the different those two microphones are quite different sounding. But I do prefer it with the polarity reversed on the batter side. You can actually hear more back here because of the bass build up. Yeah. Bass, bass. Okay, Barry. Can I hear just your snare drum for a moment? So that's the Octava top microphone. Um, I have added a bit of high frequency EQ. This is without the EQ. I still think that sounds fine, but when he was playing a pattern, I preferred it with a little brighter edge, so I used a little bit of attack on that snare drum. All my uh, I think that's, other than the filter on the overheads, that's the only equalizer I've used on anything on the tracking setup. Okay. Can I hear your small tom, please? So, uh, so this is the top mic on the rack tom. Top mic only. I'm going to add the bottom microphone without correcting the polarity and you'll hear the sound sort of suck away. Hear how it's getting thinner and thinner? And now I'm going to normalize the polarity by flipping the bottom microphone polarity. You know, all the body comes back and you can hear that sort of of the bottom head being slightly tighter. Okay, can I hear the floor tom, please? And this is the same deal. I'm going to play the floor tom. Whoa, hey now, hey now. Carry on. So it's actually doing that qualifies as bad sound. <laughs> Hang on one sec. I mean, there's a possibility that microphone has gone goofy. Let me just check the connections on that microphone real quick. Can you type in the patch tables in anywhere? Is yeah, that's what they did. Maybe the crackles, so I think maybe that's it. So the capsules are removable and that I just received the capsule to see if that's the Okay, can you play that four tom for us? There we go. All right. Perfect. All right. So that's the top side microphone. Now I'm going to add the bottom side microphone to it. Same sort of deal. You can hear it get thinner and thinner. And now as I increase the bottom side microphone, you'll hear it get louder again. That's because the balance has shifted to where it's no longer even, but more of the bottom microphone. So now this is the sort of thinnest sound. And I'm going to reverse the polarity of the top microphone. Now all the sustaining sound comes back. Okay, can you play the two toms alternately for me, please? So I'm going to try 
flipping the polarity of the floor tom microphone so we can see if we prefer it one way or the other. This is with the top side reverse, and I'm going to reverse the bottom side. I prefer it with the other way. All the microphones are open right now, yeah? This is with all the microphones open. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, can you play a simple drum beat for me, please? So these are the two Coles 4038 microphones. I've rolled off the low end quite a bit on them, and they're going through that peak limiter, the stereo peak limiter here. And now I'm going to add the stereo microphone from the front of the kit to them. So these are the Gazelle microphones in front plus the stereo microphones over the, the uh, 4038s. And I'll show you what it sounds like if I get rid of the 4038s and just use the stereo microphone. You lose a little of the brightness, but the basic sound of the stereo image is very similar still. So now I'll turn the 4038s back on. I'm going to open the ambient microphones without using any of the additional delay. So you can hear a little bit of a sustain on the snare drum, but I'm not aware of a, like a perceived size to the whole drum kit. You can just hear a little bit of sustain on the snare drum. Now I'll add the 20 milliseconds of additional delay. Now I can hear, definitely hear the sort of slapping effect of the sound going out, hitting the wall, turning around, and coming back. And I can hear it on the whole drum kit. So just for comparison, this is without the additional delay. with the delay. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you do me a favor? Can you just play a little drum beat and then go around the horn on the toms for us? You may stand down. <clears throat> all right, so those were all the mics that we talked about on the drum kit, all the gimmicks and all the everything. Uh, any questions, having just seen and heard that? How much did you roll off the bottom for the ribbons? Uh, as high as it went on the high pass filter, so uh, 500. 500? Do you compress your room mics at all? No. Uh, uh, I want to say no. I may have. I know I experimented with it, and I think I gave up on it. Okay. I think I, yeah. Do you find you, you get more of the effect you're after with the delay on the room mics than you would by compressing it? The, the, the artifacts of compression to me are extremely irritating. So like when I can hear a compressor working, yeah. <clears throat> I find that I find that distracting. It, it's you know, it's like seeing CGI in a film. It's like, <laughs> you know, come on, it's not really a rabbit. You know, it's like uh, there's something about it that that some people are not as sensitive to, right? Some people are really fond of it. Like some yeah. people love that sort of thing. When I, like when I hear that that kind of like when I can tell somebody's really going for it, but it doesn't get any louder. Yeah. Like something about that just sounds wrong and cheap to me. So um, uh, I, I tend not to like it if I can hear artifacts of compression. Like, like even here, for example, like the bass drum was being compressed 
a few dB, but I was was never I wasn't aware of it sounding right. pressed. The same with the overheads. Like the overhead mic, if I listened to the overhead mic by itself, I could tell that it was compressing slightly when it hit the snare drum. But when it was in in balance with the stereo mic, I, I, that effect was masked and, I, and it wasn't disturbing to me. Um, so yeah. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to go show you the mics on the guitar amp, uh, on the bass guitar, and you're welcome to take a look in here uh, when we come back in here. Um, but we're going to do the quick sound check on the bass guitar next, and uh, I'm going to show you two mics. Hello. Okay. Go ahead and blow. Is that full volume? There we go. So this is the Bayer 380 by itself. And um, as an insert. I have this distressor on it, relatively low ratio, about six to one, and uh, I'm using the uh, filter on the detector so that the bass notes are not as compressed, like the deeper notes, the deepest portion of the sound is not as compressed as the mid-range is. Um, my experience has been that bass guitar tends to compress 
if you're using a compressor on the bass guitar, it tends to over-compress the bass notes, um, and you get a perceived loss of volume, and that's, that filter is a very useful way of avoiding that effect. Um, so now I'll show you the, uh, this is the, that Sennheiser microphone. And I'll show you what it sounds like if I balance that against the other guy. So that's with the Sennheiser microphone uncompressed with the low end rolled off, balanced against the Bayer 380, slightly compressed, and that's a sort of composite sound, which is meant to mimic the sound of the, of the cabinet. Um, I find that, especially bass guitar, because it's hard to simulate the sort of physical effect of bass energy coming off of the cabinet when you're listening on small speakers at low volume. Um, I tend to try to mimic the effect of the bass amp rather than the absolute sound. Like, to me, that sounds pretty much like it does when I'm standing in front of it, just quieter. Um, I know that if I took a flat microphone and put it in front of the cabinet and just turned it up, it wouldn't feel like that to me. So I, I feel like I have to do these, this balancing and accommodating of, of dynamic range in order to, to simulate the effect of the, of, the, of the cabinet. But in my mind, the idea is always an, sort of an ideal of natural sound, of naturalism or realism. So, um, Yeah, and it's metering on the machine, so that it's hovering right around zero. That means there's not going to be any significant compression effect from the tape. There won't be any significant self erasure. We should keep all the high frequencies and keep all the bass energy. Alrighty, thank you. Uh, is Jen around? Yes, yes I am. Oh, you're you're a hero. Yeah. Can uh, I get you to just play your guitar for me for a minute? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll get the other, we'll get Graham and Adam in, and then we can. Do a take. Yeah. Or maybe get Graham and Adam in, in in and you guys can sort out your headphones and then we'll take a pre brief break for the van and then do a take. I'll show them. <laughs> so these are the track sheets that I use to document the session for on a song by song basis. Each one of these little cells represents one track on tape. And so the notation that I use, uh, I'll, for example, the bass drum is spread across two tracks. There's the batter side and the front side. Uh, and then in the little window underneath, I'll indicate what microphones I've used or any other significant things I put, for example, in the the ambient mic, <laughs> the ambient mics have indicated left and right what type of microphone, and, and that I've added 20 milliseconds pre delay. So, um, and then on the individual guitar tracks, I tend to write which guitar was used, which amplifier was used, what microphones were used. So, and that's mainly so that. Um, if we revisit the session in a couple of weeks, for example, to do some overdubs and he wants to know what guitar was used on the basic track for a given song, then the documentation that will help, that sort of thing. It's not absolutely critical, but I feel like it's better to be a little more thorough than a little less thorough. So. How's everybody doing? Do you uh, want to paddle around for a minute to see if the headphones have changed? Can we do Say what now, who now? Okay, super sound, okay, sorry. Um, 
So, Jen, can you give me the all clear when everyone's ready and wait for the word rolling? Yeah, we're good. Gentlemen, you're rolling. Sorry, my fault, my fault, my fault. I had them repro so they were hearing themselves. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Hang tight. I'm rewinding. Okay, everybody ready? Yep. You are rolling. <laughs> How was that for everybody? Yeah. Good job, guys. Fantastic. All right, let's hit the van. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll do a playback. Um, I don't know what the I don't know what the how critical the timing is on the van. Should we hit the van first, or should we just play? Last shot in the bay. It's twenty minutes. Oh, yeah, we'll have time for a playback. Yeah, play right there. Come on in, we'll do a playback, and then we'll sweat the van. <laughs> so, I don't know if you guys, if everybody got a look at this. Um, I have a couple questions to ask. Graham, what do you call your guitar? Which um, guitar was that? Uh, jazz master. Jazz master. And Adam, here's the telly. Telly. The red telly, do you have more than one? Okay, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the name of that song? Just 
super slinky. There's everyone. Uh, <laughs> it's warm in here. You all smell lovely, though. <laughs> Fragrant. Uh <-huh. laughs> so, do we know if that's a take yet, or do you want to listen to a playback? I'd probably do that again. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll give, um, let's play it back anyway and see what yeah. it sounds like. You guys want to come in the middle so we can hear each other? Come in there. Come in there. Come in there. This is 15 IPS recording with no noise reduction in the NAB EQ, and I'd be surprised if anyone could perceive noise as separate from the sound of music. Let me know if you do. <laughs> Just the vocal channel, so you can hear even though he's in the room with the bass amp and the guitar amp, the, the vocal isolation is reasonably good as well. Yes, hanky panky's more like spanky, and be happy until he's guilty. If you're, I mean, uh, if you're, yeah. if you, if I, you're, I think uh, maybe Taylor the vocal, but actually it's part of it as well. So it's uh, of no, no, uh, what I'm getting at is if you guys were happy with that musically, but there was a bit of the vocal that you went into, we could redo the vocal there. Yeah. Or, or if you wanted to do it the opposite, just do it with the guitar. What did the rest of y'all think about that? Yeah, I, 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 I thought my first, first note coming in 
You might have flopped the first night. Yeah. yeah. If only there was something we could do about that. <laughs> if only we were in the recording studio. <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to encourage you to keep a substandard take. All I'm saying is, no, that, that's if, almost, if it was good, if, I, if it's just apart from little if it's cosmetic just flaws, function, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And then do you remember where your it's, vocal it's is? It's just the very end. Just the very end of the vocal. Um, I kind of don't have any more. Not that I Tell you what. Noise, but... Let's indulge in the van. Okay. Yes. For anyone that wants to indulge in the van. And then we'll do that little guitar repair. And okay. We'll you know, we can do a more forensic listen for the vocal yeah, yeah, and yeah. see if there's anything else you want to repair. Okay. There's a slight harshness to the microphone from you like being right up on top of it. I don't know. Uh -huh. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, if it, if it bugs you, we could do something. Where is it? Probably the <laughs> cool. Is that one? Any of you were to buy those? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What do I need to do? Who's an advanced expert here? Anybody? Well, oh, that's the advanced expert. Yeah, tell me what you want. Right? Well, you tell me. What's the what's the changes have been? What, what is this? One day. Special. 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 Is that what's left from you? We need to get what something like? really strong. So what do you want to add? Square sausage. Square sausage. I don't care. Okay. Square sausage. Square sausage. Okay. 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 Yeah, I mean that one so I'm not talking about it.